So welcome back to everyone. Good afternoon to those who are joining us now. So welcome to panel three, who is listening on the vulnerability of connection. We will have three speakers. Um, and the first of them is Ellie Waters. Ellie Waters. Um, oops. Um, so Ellie Waters is a first year PhD candidate in French at Wadham College at the University of Oxford. And last year in 2021, she completed a Master of Studies in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studied also at Oxford University. And she graduated the year before with a BA in Modern and Medieval Languages from the University of Cambridge. So Ellie is giving a paper today entitled From Your Pen to God's Ear, Prayer, Writing and Precarity in, Fatima's, in Fatima Darcy's La Petite Dernière and Ya Gyasi's Transcendent Kingdom. So over to you, Ellie, and we look forward to your paper. Thank you so much, Yuta. And I just wanted to say thank you to Sandra and Adina. Um, again, like all of the other speakers, for putting on such a wonderful conference so far. Um, I think like many people in this late stage of May, I have quite a big writing deadline coming up, but I've done none of that today because it's been so enthralling and so illuminating. So thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm just gonna share my screen. If you can't hear or see, just shout because I can't see you. Okay. Bad. So um, today I'm going to be talking about Fatima Dassi's La Petite Dernière and Ya Jassi's Transcendent Kingdom. Just to give some content warnings before I start, this presentation will include discussion of experiences of racism, addiction, overdose and grief. Uh, my paper will be about 15, 20 minutes long, and I'd be so happy to send over the slides afterwards. So just let me know and feel free to go have a cup of tea now if you prefer. Um, Yad Jassi's Transcendent Kingdom and Fatima Dassi's La Petite Dernière, which translate from the translates from the French as the youngest daughter or the last one, were first published 12 days apart in the late summer of 2020. Transcendent Kingdom was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, whilst La Petite Dernière won the Prix Les Arocs in the first book category. Both novels are feminist works of autofiction, set in the 21st century and narrated by the youngest daughter, the only one born outside of the, the family's African homeland. Speaking in the first person, these daughter protagonists paint portraits of precarity and shame whilst probing the face that they inherited. Jesse is a Ghanaian American writer whose debut Homegoing, which is on the slide, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Best First Book and was named by the BBC as one of the top 100 novels that shaped our world. Her second novel, Transcendent Kingdom, follows US born protagonist Gifty, a sixth year doctoral candidate in neuroscience at the Stanford University School of Medicine. The novel offers passages from her preteen diaries as she reflects on her Alabama childhood specifically her brother's fatal overdose, her father's definitive abandonment to Ghana, and her relationship with God through the Pentecostal church. Das is an Algerian French writer whose literary debut, La Petite Dernière, saw her celebrated widely as, and I cite France Inter here, the most auspicious debut novelist of the literary season. The name Fatima Das is a pseudonym. The author has explained that she has taken the name of her protagonist in La Petite Dernière, Fatima Das, and adopted it as a pen name. So throughout this essay, when I say Das, I mean the novel's author, and when I say Fatima, I mean the novel's protagonist and also narrator. The text follows Fatima as she studies her situation and identity as a French-born Muslim lesbian from an Algerian family. The novel's form is characterized by asyndetic lists, parataxis, and anaphora. That is to say, lots of repetition and short sentences. And each new sentence often means a new line break, as you can see from the example on the slide which is actually the first page of the novel. Um, I just wanted to show you this so that you get a sense of what the text looks like on the page. Um, and I'll be coming back to the formal aspect later on. As Fatima travels between Clichy sous bois and Algiers, she studies all that she is not, but ought to be according to her familial and religious values. 
The publication of La Petite Dernière sparked controversy for its presentation of queer and Muslim identities as irreconcilable. The polemic swelled when Das confirmed in an interview in September 2020 that she considers homosexuality to be a sin within Islam. Since these remarks, Das has described La Petite Dernière as her own interpretation of the religion, explaining that her novel sought to not to speak on anyone's behalf, but rather to study, quote, how we construct ourselves through our self-hatred. Speaking in the first person, Gifty of Transcendent Kingdom and Fatima of La Petite Dernière scrutinized their encounters with racism and loss, in addition to their relationships with the beliefs, values, and diasporic cultures that they inherited. And when I use the word diaspora, I mean um, a voluntary migration from Africa, at least in the immediate family history of both protagonists. Um, both La Petite Dernière and Transcendent Kingdom place the uncertainty, shame, and solitude felt by Fatima and Gifty as women of colour emerging from states of vulnerability as well as socioeconomic precarity in friction with their experiences of religious and secular faith. In La Petite Dernière, Fatima negotiates the line she believes herself to embody between Islam and queerness, um, the conflict that she believes herself to embody between Islam and queerness, and in Transcendent Kingdom, Gifty loses faith in Christianity in favour of science following the fatal overdose of her adolescent brother. These conflicts manifest and attempt to be reconciled through creative reading and writing practices, as both Gifty and Fatima map their pain and faith from pen to page to prayer. In Transcendent Kingdom, Gifty's brother Nana develops an opioid addiction following a sports-related ankle injury for which he was treated with the painkiller OxyContin. After several years of rehab and relapse, Gifty's brother, and I quote directly from the text, overdosed on heroin and died in the parking lot of a Starbucks, end quote. In contrast to Nana's long endured suffering and the enduring grief of his loved ones, the shortness of this statement emphasizes the inconsequence of Nana's death to, neo to the neoliberal neo-colonial world as a cold man-made space for the customers of Starbucks, a multinational corporation tangled in the non-ethics of advanced capitalism, the car park swallows up the young black male immigrant from a single parent lower middle class household in a way that goes unquestioned, unnoticed and unwarned. As Judith Butler writes in Frames of War, lives cannot be apprehended as injured or lost if they are not first apprehended as living. The systemic erasure of these lives is tied to what Butler describes as their politically induced precarity. Certain populations are left at heightened risk of disease, poverty and starvation as a direct result of failing social and economic networks of support. As Garnet, oh sorry, I've got a mouse, like several mouses. There we go, it's all fine. As Ghanaians living in Alabama, the only black members of their local church, if these family are repeatedly failed by this politically induced precarity. Well before her brother's death, Gifty sees her parents fight daily um, about money, how there was never enough. They start to water down the orange juice to calculate, quote, down to the cent what every scrap of food in the house cost. When Gifty's father is accused of shoplifting three times in four months, and we can strongly assume that this accusation is racially charged, he is left humiliated and dis disillusioned. He stops leaving their Huntsville home, and then he leaves it all together. He crosses the Atlantic, returning to Kumasi, Ghana, without his family in the US, where his wife is forced to work 12-hour shifts every day but Sunday. Gifty's life on the breadline resonates with that of Fatima in La Petite Dernière. As she recalls Saturday morning visits to the food bank, when Fatima was eight, the family moved from her birthplace of saint germain en to clichy sous bois a town that Fatima calls a Muslim town or a town for Muslims. Migrating from the western to the eastern suburbs of Paris, Fatima's family leaves a flat where the three daughters shared a room, where the elders slept on the floor, for a new town inhabited by people that, as Fatima stresses, are like them. And yet, yeah, quote unquote, are like them. And I stress here the enduring colonial racism that organizes the region's urban geography. From this quote unquote Muslim town, Fatima commutes for over three hours into and out of Paris via public transport, a journey that, in fact, lasts longer than the homegoing flight from Paris to Algiers. Speaking to Laurent Bastide on the feminist podcast La Poudre, Das considers how the shame of alterity and economic precarity has inflected, even afflicted, her own identity formation. It is with and through shame that I became who I am. I think shame is everywhere. 
the shame of being poor, the shame of living in the suburbs, the shame of not corresponding to what is expected of you in society. Das identifies shame as the marrow of her identity, as that which shaped her sense of self. When shamed, Sarah Ahmed writes, one's body begins, seems to burn up with negation. As Fatima grows up in the shame of supposedly deviating from the norm, her identity is formed through what Sylvan Tompkins calls negative affects, affects of high toxicity, such as shame, distress, anguish, contempt, anger, disgust, and fear. Um, I possibly said anger twice then, but I meant anguish and anger. These are felt, he writes, and this is a quote again, as a sickness of the soul which leaves us naked, defeated, alienated, and lacking in dignity. The indignity of shame is compounded for Fatima and Lakajidania by her difficult relationship with her faith and queer sexuality. She describes herself as, a quote, a Muslim, I think, but not a very good one, end quote. Fatima writes of her identification with Islam whilst outlining her perceived pitfalls, pitfalls as a practicing Muslim. Her sense of inadequacy resounds throughout La Petite Dernière as Fatima shoulders the religious import of her name. In Islam, Fatima is the youngest daughter of the Prophet Muhammad and deemed to be the most noble woman in paradise. The novel returns routinely to Fatima's concern over tarnishing or disgracing her name as she fears failing familial and Islamic expectations. In Jassy's Transcendent Kingdom, faith is similarly a source of conflict for its protagonist. Whilst exploring her childhood faith, which stems from the Pentecostalism practiced in her first Assemblies of God Church, Gifty reflects on how and when she lost it. That's her faith. Her brother's death, she writes, ultimately felled the long growing tree of my belief. And that again was a quote. The stability suggested in the well-established tree of belief is juxtaposed by the sudden felling, the severing of faith. The severing is left unbandaged and continues into the present. Her intimations of God in the narration evade the reverential capitalization of his pronouns. In the throes of her brother's illness and grief that le- and the grief it leaves behind, Gifty turns in both her child and adult lives to writing. As a child, Gifty found solace in re- religious journal keeping. She filled diaries and addressed each entry to God, penning her prayers to feel like he was there reading and listening. As an adult, Gifty is a sixth year PhD student writing her thesis on the neuroscience of addiction. In this way, Jessie plays on the homonym journal from the journals kept by the young Gifty to the scientific journal in which the adult Gifty is due to publish her research. Scholarly writing is also reflected in the way Gifty's childhood diary entries appear within the narration. On the slide, I offer one page from Transcendent Kingdom. I think it's um, page 33. The text in bold is Gifty's diary entry written during the years of her brother's addiction. It begins with dear God and ends with a prayer for her sibling. He looked normal. Please God, let him stay like this forever. Below the text in bold is a single sentence which forms part of the adult Gifty's narration. In response to her childhood prayer, she writes, My brother died of a heroin overdose three months later. That is three months after the diary entry was written. In this instance, the adult Gifty engages with her childhood self, using hindsight to respond critically to this primary material, highlighting its faith, a long established tree waiting to be felled. The entries appear in their original form. As the image on this slide shows, they are pasted between the adult Gifty's commentary, presenting the reader with primary material and secondary close readings. Gifty's textual engagement with these diary entries implies that she herself inserted them into the narrative plane, a kind of creative reading slash writing practice that troubles the line between Gifty as protagonist and Jassy as author. In any case, as the author of her childhood childhood diaries, of her adult commentary, and perhaps in some way of Transcendent Kingdom itself, Gifty reclaims some agency in the face of vulnerability and precarity through the act of writing. The same is true for Fatima. After being subjected to a teacher's Islamophobia at college, Fatima leaves formal education and instead writes a memoir. That is, I think we can presume, we can discuss this because I keep going through it in my head. Instead writes a memoir, that is La Petite Dernière. Um, Leaving the institution behind, Fatima abandons the three hour journey to school and recovers this time for writing, for reclaiming her narrative in the first person. All but two chapters of La Petite Dernière open with a personal introduction, Je m'appelle Fatima or My Name is Fatima. 
and I've put a few examples um, of these openings on the slide. This act of self-presentation, perhaps self-preservation, occurs a total of 73 times across the novel. As such, Je m'appelle Fatima becomes the self-proving nucleus of the novel. After each introduction, Fatima goes about questioning and consolidating her identity as a worshipper of God, born with a name that she cannot disgrace. As I mentioned before, and you, as you can see on the screen, Fatima's reflections appear on the page in ascendetic lists. A staccato verse that allows her to pack her identity into the clarifying order of language without having recourse to the normative shape of prose. Rather, her search for clarity in her homophobic sexuality, and that's phobic in brackets, <coughs> excuse me, appears on the page as riffs or rap lyrics, the likeness to which has been confirmed by Des, who has remarked its influence on her style. But the novel has also been likened to religious incantation, given its anaphora and repetition. Incantations like the Dakir, the reciting or chanting of God's name, which occupies Fatima as she commutes about the Parisian region. As such, the novel's form is distinctly hybrid, its rap style performativity melting into prayer or vice versa. This queer form, a reflection of the author protagonist herself, offers Fatima indi an individualized space in which to voice or script her identity. It affords her a space to write and recite, to speak as the subject she is. And so briefly to conclude, in this paper, I've offered a comparative reading of Fatima Das's La Petite Dernière and Yajasi's Transcending Kingdom, two feminist works of autofiction that were published in 2020 and which study Afro diasporic daughterhood in the 21st century. Faced with politically induced precarity and trauma, protagonists Fatima and Gifty find an antidote in faith. If not religious faith, then, put the fa then faith in putting pen to paper. By composing theses, filling journals, writing memoirs, the protagonists interrogate their relationships with family, religion, and identity, finding solace in creative practices to see and make anew. Thank you. Um, our third paper. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Pooja Sanchetti who is an assistant professor of English literature at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune, India. Her research interests include magical realism, post-colonial and post-modern studies and contemporary South Asian and feminine fiction. She also teaches English language and researches the interdisciplinary domain of language and science. Um, so, her paper of this afternoon is entitled All of Our Ghosts Behind Us and Before Us, The Terrible Dark World, a close reading of Tamima Anam's The Bones of Grace. Um, th thank you, Yuta, for the introduction. I'm sorry, I should have started my slide share before you finished. Sorry, uh, so I made a small change in the title. Um, it now reads all of our ghosts behind us and before us the terrible, terrible dark world, uh, the politics of the vulnerable self in Temima Anam's The Bones of Grace. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world today. Um, <clears throat> so I will be spending a bulk of the time given to me to discuss the causes and effects of two kinds of vulnerabilities. The first pertinent to individual subjectivity set within materially comfortable conditions and the other of the oppressed laboring class and the juxtaposition of these two as ex expressed in Bangladeshi Anglophone novelist uh, Temima Anam's work, The Bones of Grace, which was published in 2016. I will also discuss briefly my own discomfort with the uh, tenuman of the novel. I derive my understanding of vulnerability and precarity primarily from Judith Butler's work. And at the cost of oversimplifying her theory and repeating some, some ideas that, may, that many of us here are probably more well-versed in than I am, I will point out three key ideas that underlie my arguments here. First, that subjectivity is always already created within networks of connections with others, known and unknown, and in contexts that precede and predate the dynamic creation and recreation of the I. Butler says, and I quote, we are at once acted upon and acting, end quote, and our responsibility lies in the junction between the two. 
even as an individual is a part of a community, they are also never fully described or circumscribed by the labels of that community. In effect, Butler points to the necessary public political constitution of the individual, but also gives space for transformation and action. The individual, embedded in the collective and vice versa, has an ethical duty to take responsibility for the more vulnerable other. I quote again from Butler, I find that my very formation implicates the other in me, that my own foreignness to myself is paradoxically the source of my ethical connection with others, end quote. Second, that vulnerability to being injured, to death, to loss is a necessary condition of being and is manifested among other ways in the desire for another and in mourning the loss of another. We are always already vulnerable and the condition of vulnerability again precedes the formation of I. Third, the caveat that Butler offers. Some bodies, communities, and groups are more vulnerable than others. Their safety and lives are more precarious. The question of ethics becomes extremely important to the act of witnessing the vulnerability of the other, even as one may experience or understand one's own vulnerability when experiencing violence or grief. With the witness, with the witness lies the ethical responsibility to see, hear, tell, remember, and act. Butler argues for the transformative potential when one recognizes vulnerability and, one, and when one mourns over the loss of a person or a place. I quote, perhaps mourning has to do with agreeing to undergo a transformation, submitting to a transformation, the full result of which one cannot know in advance. However, we do select who we find worth grieving for, whose lives are mournable, and the narratives we allow into our sphere of, the underst of, of understanding the world. Nonetheless, given the interconnectedness of our subjectivities and those of others, we should be able to reflect on those unknown to us and their grievability as well. I'm, so, I'm just going to check chat in case there's something. Okay. <clears throat> the Bones of Grace is the third novel in a trilogy that charts the lives of three generations of women of a family, as well as the trajectory of the nation state of Bangladesh from the 1970s to the present. The protagonist of the novel Bones of Grace is Zubeda, the adoptive daughter of a well-to-do couple in Dhaka, who were also actively involved in the freedom struggle. She marries her longtime lover, Rashid, who is from an obscenely rich and elitist family in a country still very much steeped in economic disparity. The silence over her birth parents and the lack she feels in her own history form the ground upon which much of her adult life and interactions are based. Through a disenchantment with her birth country, her inability, to, in her inability to find a career with purpose in spite of being educated at Harvard, her distaste of her husband's rich family, and a feeling of inadequacy with regard to her own adoptive parents leaves her wanting a different kind of family and life, one that is not yet visible to her. As a way to escape these fractured relationships, she's tasked by a friend of the family to help an American filmmaker who is documenting the lives of workers at a ship-breaking yard in the town of Chittagong in Bangladesh. Ship-breaking is a really big industry in Bangladesh. This is a space for the juxtaposition of the elite and the economically vulnerable, and I will explore this interaction in some detail in a little while. As the novel progresses, Zubeda finds herself increasingly frayed by her circumstances and her emotional struggle to cope with the missing parts of her history. Eventually, she discovers that her birth mother was dirt poor and forced to sell her as a baby, and that she had a twin sister who was forced to become a prostitute and is now dead of disease. The trope of twinness is also connected to the twin destinies of a nation and, the sh and sheer luck rather than merit that can determine the circumstances of one's life. The narrative of the novel is not a straightforward third person narrative, but a confession, a letter written by Zubeda to Elijah, her estranged lover in America, as an expiation for her actions and explanation for why she finally betrayed him. This choice of narrative strategy immediately brings to focus the guilt that Zubeda feels and the desire to explain herself to him and to the reader. It is also a mourning for what she tried to achieve and what she lost and what transformations, however limited, were wrought. It is key to remember that the listener uh, is, not, is not live, rather he is expected to become the listener and thus the act of listening is belated. Uh, Zubeda mourns for her missing lineage and the mother and twin sister she never knew, her miscarried child, a career as a paleontologist that did not take off, a disintegrating marriage, class guilt, and a dissociation from social, national, social and nationalist causes that had anchored her grandmother and mother. 
Though much loved by her adoptive and extended family, Subeta feels a lack that does not let her quite settle anywhere. Although given her material circumstances, she is a cosmopolite. I quote, everything about my life was too easy. I could love whomever, whomever I wanted and marry or not marry them or change my religion or get divorced multiple times and have children with three different fathers if I wanted. I came from what you call a traditional society, but I was not enthralled to that society. What I was enthralled to was the past, end quote. Towards the end of the novel, she returns to Harvard to assemble the skeleton of the Ambulocetus natans, whom she call, has named Diana. This is an amphibious creature that is a link between land animals and the whale. Like this creature, Zubeda believes herself to be an in-between, but ironically at home, neither here nor there. However, preserving this part of history is a replacement for her own history that is incomplete and cannot be put together. The narrative, therefore, throws the protagonist's subjectivity under a sharp lens, interrogating and articulating her innermost desires and anxieties, and her feeling of displacement and disaffection through her own perspective, shaped as it is by those around her and her material circumstances. Resolutions are hard to achieve, even when she has found piecemeal answers to her questions of her own past. When she finds that no one knows for sure where her birth mother came from and how she died, Zubeda consciously becomes a storyteller, creating a history for this woman because none exists, and thereby creating her own lineage. This is a sort of recognition of what is lost forever and can never, can never be recovered, but must be imaginatively recreated. <clears throat> My contention is that Zubeda, overcompensating for this lack of genealogy, and rightly or wrongly interpreting that the actions of those closest to her are based on bits of this knowledge that she herself is not privy to swings between two extremes. This pendulum of desires leads her to have an affair with Elijah, a man she knew briefly during her time at Harvard. Elijah is in many ways her complete opposite. He is secure in his family's history, has no questions about his past or any concrete plans for the future and can exist solely in the moment. I argue that she tries to create a family with Elijah because she has no tangled histories with him. The other extreme is her knee-jerk action of trying to adopt her newly discovered niece, her dead sister's daughter Shona, and creating an ersatz family based on shared blood. However, both extremes fail, and the novel ends with her piecing together the skeleton of Diana in a what she calls ghostless space of the Natural History Museum, while recognizing that she herself can never be without her ghosts. Different kinds of vulnerability are exposed and acted upon when she interacts with different people. Elijah's firm knowledge of himself in the world exposes her lack of the same. Rashid's elitism, elitism bothers her just as much as her mother's complete commitment to the cause of Biranganas or women who were raped during the Bangladesh War for Independence. She sympathizes with the shipbreaking yard workers but cannot align herself with them completely because of her own cosmopolitan upbringing and yet feels out of place both within her familial circles and outside of them. <clears throat> Since the novel focuses on Zubeda, I am also spending relatively lesser time focusing on a different kind of vulnerability but a very important one. The socio-economic vulnerability of the shipbreaking yard workers who are poor migrant laborers from within Bangladesh and whose location in the informal sector exposes them to great degrees of physical and economic exploitation, social dislocation, death, and stark dehumanization. Precarity, as defined by Butler, is, uh, and I think Ellie referred to the same quote, the politically induced condition in which, in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks, resulting in greater vulnerability to death and physical, social, and emotional injury. As social beings and as vulnerable bodies, we depend on others just as they depend on our care. Alongside, we also rely on institutionalized forms of care and recognition, while also being exploited by such institutions as global capitalism and racism. Through the glimpses into the lives of these workers, sometimes forced to migrate to other parts of the world as well, citizenless in their own country and outside of it, becomes apparent that some individuals and communities are obviously more vulnerable to economic and state exploitation than others, but their struggles and sufferings may be rendered abject and meaningless to the uncaring witness. A quote by Butler encapsulates the condition of these workers trenchantly. Vulnerability, including corporal vulnerability to being injured by the other, and I quote, becomes highly exacerbated under certain social and political conditions, especially those in which violence is a way of life, and the means to secure self-defense are limited." End quote. Zubeda at the shipbreaking yard is a witness to the vulnerabilities of the workers. 
through her act of hearing the testimonies of the exploitation they suffer and seeing their living conditions and their, and their often fatal injuries, the, the reader also becomes a witness to the unorganized labor classes that exist across the world. These informal labor sectors have no job security, no assurance of minimum wage, no medical benefits, and suffer dislocation, poverty, exploitation, injury, and death so frequently that they never believe a different life is possible. Any aspiration for a better life that they may have leads to violent death and fading away into oblivion, only briefly mourned by a small community. They are the signifiers of, of the fractured composition of a nation and of the severely une uneven effects of global capitalism and neoliberalist politics pertinently in the global south. <clears throat> An exposure to others' vulnerabilities must ideally, ideally make one more open to accepting them within the fold of one's own actions. The narrative is problematic in that it returns only to Zubeta and the subaltern are left behind or are dead or forgotten. The transformation that could have taken place does not come to its full potential. For instance, when she reads the documents, Gabriela, the filmmaker, and she had put together of the interviews with the workers, she finds that, and I quote, the words were flat on the page, one sad story following another, each starting with its own same moment of fracture, an illness, a bad crop, the death of a father. And the long journey south, the bag of things they carried, the tiny pocket of hope, and then arriving at the shipyard and finding the acres of steel and rust, and Mr. Ali, the dormitory, long dark nights carrying iron on their shoulders to the sound of chanting. I felt nothing, no sorrow, no jot of recognition as the words I had heard and recorded appeared in black and white, end quote. Each time there is a chance to let the other's vulnerabilities overtake her own and guide her actions, like when she sees three workers close to death because of their injuries, somehow her own story takes center stage, which begs the question, is this a singular, deeply flawed character who cannot step outside of herself, or a representative of the global elite cosmopolitan class, including people like myself, who may be witnesses, but eventually return to our safe comfort zones where we are not required to act upon what we have seen. Does the narrative do justice to the wounds of the other it has exposed when it returns to Harvard and longs for the return of the estranged lover? If, as Butler points out, and I quote, to be injured means that one has a chance to reflect upon injury, to find out the mechanisms of its distribution, to find out who else suffers from unexpected violence, dispossession, and fear, and in what ways, close quote, then is Zubeda the thinking acting agent? Is she paralyzed by the overwhelming volume of tragedy and the lack of a single source of a problem and therefore a straightforward fixable solution, or is she willfully turning away from action? A broader question also follows. Literary narratives have great subversive and political potential, yet do they, they do not necessarily need to have an overt political potential. In the preceding two novels in this trilogy, the complications at the very heart of the formation of the nation and the fundamentalist bent it took are key to the plot. Is the disaffection of Zubeda in the 21st century symptomatic of our generation of globalization, the internet, and a strange distance from the worlds we live in, a paralysis in terms of transformation and action? My discomfiture with the way the novel ends is clearly also a recognition of the complicity of people like me, part of the elite in the global south, in sustaining these systems of exploitation because we are advantaged through this unequal system. Zubeda is on a quest to find her roots, but when she does, does she really, can she really embrace them, embrace the truth of her birth mother's backbreaking poverty and give up her class privileges? She doesn't. This is what problematizes her connection to her own quest. Once we find the answers to our own vulnerabilities and witness the other's vulnerabilities, what do we do or what can we do? Is Zubeda's recognition of her own vulnerabilities, her inability to define herself without Elijah or her work, a brave acceptance of her own limitations to change the world, or is it an easy cop-out? Or do we read the testimonies of the workers and their life events as they are interwoven into the first-person narrative as a necessary but realistically limited exposure to the juxtaposition of two very different worlds that exist parallelly but rarely overlap? To go back to the question of ethics, what are the ethics of the witness? If the quote in the title of my paper, which occurs at the very end of the novel, is anything to go by, then this is a very pessimistic narrative where there was no happy resolution in the past and there is none in the future. Thank you. Dr. Roberta Garrett is a senior lecturer on the Creative Writing Program and the Media Foundation Program 
in the Department of Arts and Cultural Industries at the University of East London. She has published widely on representations of gender, class, and race in popular literature and film, and is the author of Postmodern Chick Flicks, The Return of the Woman's Film, and co-editor of We Need to Talk About Family, uh, essays on neoliberalism, the family, and popular culture, um, and the author of Writing the Modern Family, Contemporary Literature, Motherhood, and neoliberal culture, as well as a number of um, article in, um, in Sorry, academic. Sorry, I didn't mean to add all that. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. So you can also check out uh, the more uh, more articles and stories uh, in the in the bio that uh, that was shared and is available on the website. And the title of the paper is "Fail Again, uh, Fail Better: The Politics of Female Failure," in the work of uh, Megan Nolan and Nisha Dolan. So, can you see my screen now, everyone? Yes, yep. we're good. Yeah, sorry. I, um, you know, on the Mac, when you do the design ideas, it came up with that face and it made me laugh, <laughs> the crying face. So I thought I'd keep, keep it on there. Um, right. So when I was thinking about this paper and the potential value of the exploration of failure and particularly an understanding of vulnerability as something that seems increasingly regarded as associated with failure in the mainstream definitions of how feminism and feminist goals are understood, I thought back to an exhibition of the work of Louise, the artist and sculptress Louise Bourgeois held at the Freud Museum about 10 years ago. Um, and there was a particular quote that stuck in my mind from that exhibition. Can you all see that quote? Mine's covered up by the sidebar with people's pictures in. <laughs> yep, we can. Yeah. So it said, I have failed as a wife, as a woman, as a mother, as a hostess, as an artist, as a businesswoman, as a friend, as a daughter, as a sister, I have not failed as a truth seeker. And at that time, I was writing about maternal memoirs, and maternal memoirs are another place where you get a lot of shame, guilt, self-exposure, and so on. Um, and it really kind of struck a chord with me. But I think most of us would understand this statement as referring to bourgeois failure to comply with certain normative, socially validated views of what it means to be a perfect wife, woman, mother, and so forth, rather than her inability to bring anything positive or meaningful to those roles. Um, but the key statement here is her bold assertion below that, that she has not failed as a seeker of truth. And, you know, if people familiar with her work, what it's usually seen to do is reveal, as you can see, looking at the spider, the famous spider sculpture there, reveal certain critical truths, perhaps, about women's experience um, and those concerning motherhood in particular that contradict accepted social norms. So in more general terms, thinking about this kind of tradition of female art and culture, which is critical of social norms, it might be argued that when it comes to women's experience, being a seeker of truth will inevitably entail exploring feelings and experiences that contradict patriarchal constructions of feminine success and achievement, and are therefore inextricably linked with notions of social and even personal failure. As we know, this has long been one of the most powerful currents in feminist art and culture, albeit, as Judith Halperstam states, one that lies in the shadow side of the positivist story of liberal feminism. Uh, in the seminal work of visual artists such as Bourgeois, or more recently, I think we could say that this is also taking place in Tracy Emin's recent work, or in writing in the work of modernist writers such as Jean Rhys, who I was always, you know, giving my students Jean Rhys and they were always saying, oh, she's always whining, she's such a victim. And I had to work really hard at getting them to see that slightly differently. Um, Rhys, Mansfield, 
the modernists or the more recent work of writers such as Jeanette Winterson, Rachel Cusk, who I'm working on an edited collection on, Bernadine Evaristo, Natasha Brown and Leila Abalela, women's art and culture has insistently returned to the exploration of rejection, pain, humiliation, vulnerability and failure. Now, um, particularly if you know your Freud and other psychoanalytic critics, um, the reasons for this are not hard to identify. As Kay Mitchell argues in her recent book, Writing Shame, to be born female is to be born in a pre-existing state of culturally assigned shame that is, as she states, both deeply personal and ineluctably social and relational. In the work of the many, many of the aforementioned writers, this sense of female shame and its association with confessional forms of writing, that is, those that prioritise and foreground the most personal aspects of the subject's life, um, intersects with various forms of body shaming, queer shaming, mother shaming, and the shaming of black and brown women in terms of a perceived failure to conform to racial beauty norms, Western uh, racial beauty norms. We also know that much women's autobiographical and confessional writing from the 1960s onwards developed specifically as a response to what was at that time, the predominant form of autobiographical writing as that which privileged the formation of triumphant white male subjectivity. Okay, so, so we're, we're aware of that history, I think most of us, the kind of confessional tendencies within women's autobiographical fiction, which is, like I say, is, is fairly well established. Um, yet, I would say, even taking account of this well-established history of women's writing that explores vulnerability and failure, it would be fair to say that the last few years have witnessed an extraordinary explosion of women's confessional life writing in the form of essays, memoirs, and what could loosely be called autofiction. And with this in mind, I want to look at the work of two young female Irish writers and their recently published and highly successful autobiographical texts that explore female shame, rejection, and vulnerability. So Megan Nolan's Acts of Desperation, published in 2021, and Nisha Dolan's Exciting Times, published in 2020 and long listed for the Women's Prize. And like I say, they both sold very, very well as well. Um, so I want to discuss this and then conclude by proposing some potential reasons for this flowering of confessional women's writing, particularly young women's writing, that are relevant to these works and also to current women's fiction uh, more broadly. Okay, so um, just to think about Nolan and Dolan, and it's just coincidence that their names happen to rhyme. Um, although there are some distinct differences, which I, I will come to, I've paired them as both novels that focus on the lives of young, educated, intelligent women from the Republic of Ireland, who are negotiating the challenges of young adulthood in terms of embarking on their working lives and navigating sexual, the sexual and emotional uh, relationships and experiences. While Dolan's Exciting Times is written in a more overtly satirical style than Acts of Desperation, both are retrospective and are framed by the narrator slash protagonist's self-ironizing voice. Now, in both, the protagonists appear to have little focused ambition and have drifted into badly paid and exploitative jobs, which they find tedious and undemanding. Having dropped out of uni in Dublin, the narrator protagonist of Nolan's Acts of Desperation, who significantly has no name within the text, moves from working in a burger bar to a boring clerical job, while Ava, the protagonist of Exciting Times, has, which is sort of ironically named, has completed her degree and travelled to Hong Kong, but is also frustrated, bored and underpaid as a TEFL teacher who's denied toilet breaks. Um, she's also got an awareness of her own colonial history and therefore feels very ambivalent about teaching the children of rich Chinese parents that they must learn English to get on in life. Significantly, both texts say relatively little about their protagonist's working life. 
Instead, the core of both narratives is an account of a highly, ex- at, sorry, at the core of both narratives is an account of a highly exploitative and unequal relationship with a man. Um, in Acts of Desperation, the narrator protagonist begins her story by stating that the first time I saw him, I pitied him terribly. And like many of her subsequent statements, her first view of Kieran, the beautiful half Danish, half Irish, unsuccessful art critic that she becomes besotted with, reveals a woeful lack of judgment. Through descriptions of Kieran's voice, gestures and responses to others, it's made very clear to the reader that Kieran is arrogant, emotionally detached, and as the narrative progressive, increasingly emotionally and physically abusive. Despite, or perhaps because of his emotional unavailability, the narrator responds to his coldness with ever more desperate attempts to convince him to return her adoration. She agrees with all of his opinions, drops her circle of friends, and obsesses over his ex-lover. She's convinced that he's her intellectual and moral superior, when nothing of what is revealed of Kieran suggests this. So there's a sort of double layering of the narrative where she's sort of telling you how wonderful he is, but also kind of encouraging through what we're actually told about him more directly um, to critique that. When she realises that he has been continually in contact with his ex-girlfriend throughout their relationship, she avoids confronting him and instead takes a masochistic pleasure in pouring over his emails to his ex and looking at her Instagram account, tormenting herself with fantasies of them as representing the perfect, beautiful couple that she longs to be part of. When she takes a trip out out of Dublin to see her family at Christmas, he invites his ex-girlfriend to stay and cruelly and unexpectedly rejects her while he re-establishes his relationships with his ex, offering no apology or explanation. She endures a couple of, uh, sorry, she endures a complete emotional and psychological collapse, but is overjoyed when Kieran and his ex, his tempestuous relationship explodes and she eagerly takes up his offer to move into his apartment. Once there, she willingly assumes the role of cook and cleaner in a desperate bid to make him dependent on her invisible and unacknowledged domestic labour, while she's also while also secretly reassuming the self-cutting and food-restricting behaviour of her teenage years. The narrator repeatedly asserts that she has no identity beyond loving him and attempting to keep him happy and close to her side. Significantly, the narrator only begins to tire of Kieran and rebel against his control when he appears to finally accept her as a girlfriend and a permanent partner. She then pursues various casual sexual relationships, resulting in a confrontation with Kieran um, in which he sexually assaults her. The narrative only moves beyond her self-abasement and obsession with male approval in the final sections when she rejects another less obviously abusive boyfriend called Mark, who also then sexually assaults her. She betrays no immediate reaction to the assault, but when they later go swimming in the, in the ocean, she leaves him, a weak swimmer, thrashing in the water while she glides off, ending on the following passage. Um, and this is quite a long quote, but I just wanted to show you because I think it's fairly significant. Um, can you all see that? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. I thought of Mark's annoyed face and his worry when he could no longer keep track of me snaking off into the ocean where I enjoyed the smell of my perfume coming off the water. I thought of all the worry I had solicited from Kieran and from other men with the food and the cutting and the crying and the sex, the whole great presentation of my rage and hurt. I thought how full my life and my head had been forever with these things with the desperation to be loved by a man, with the idea that a man's adoration or need to fuck me would make the bad parts of myself be quiet forever. I thought that a man's love would make me so full up that I'd never need to drink, eat or cut or do anything at all to my body. I thought they'd take that over for me. What would I think about now that I wasn't thinking about love and sex? That would be the next thing, trying to figure out what what to fill up all that space with but that was all right, that would follow. Um, Now I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but the core relationship in Dolan's exciting times is far less brutal than than the narrator of Acts of Desperation's relationship with Kieran. But it also explores 
the narrator called Ava in this one, she does have a name, uh, her attempts to cajole a withholding and emotionally inept man, Julian, a posh English public school in Oxford, educated banker a few years her, sinis, uh, her senior, to upgrade their casual friends with ben benefits relationship to that of a committed heterosexual couple. Like the narrator, uh, the narrator protagonist in Acts of Desperation, she analyzes and dissects every casual comment made by Julian, looking for clues that he might return her feelings and fully accept her as a girlfriend, while also feigning indifference to avoid frightening him by appearing but too needy or demanding. While Julian, unlike Kieran, at least appears to enjoy Ava's company, their banter and their sexual relationship, the exploitative and unequal aspect of the relationship is also explored through the power dynamics of their respective class positions. In a notoriously expensive region, i.e. Hong Kong, um, Paulie paid over, lives rent-free in Julian's luxurious high-rise apartment, and despite never being acknowledged as his girlfriend, accepts expensive gifts in returns for his lukewarm affection and performing some traditional female chores, such as ironing shirts and packing his suitcase for business trips. Julian also teases her about her ethnicity, her lack of money and her left-wing politics. More seriously, he voices little objection when his snobby friends uh, make demeaning comments about her, one of them referring to her as being like a jippo with elocution lessons, I mean, presumably referring to her Irish identity and her accent. Um, as in Acts of Desperation, the latter part of the text see her starting to pull against this dynamic rejecting the stark inequality of their relationship and forming a lesbian relationship with her Chinese friend, Edith, who openly declares her love for Ava. Like Acts of Desperation, the narrative ends with Ava rejecting Julian's grudging offer to accompany him to Frankfurt, where she knows no one and has no job, but he's been transferred by his bank and running to embrace and reunite with, with Edith because they've had an argument about the status of her relationship with Julian, but she finally seems to choose, um, choose Edith over Julian. Okay, so following on from Marnie's paper earlier today, um, it does seem that novels by young women in which the key protagonists appear to have little ambition, few career opportunities, and deal so openly in the exploration of being trapped and abused and ill-treated by male partners seem puzzling and anachronistic given the high visibility of neoliberal Western narratives of gender equality, female empowerment and career success. And, you know, I'm thinking about the whole kind of lean-in thing and, and the emphasis on career individualism that we've talked about quite a lot today. But of course, this is precisely the point of such texts. As Rosgill and Shani Orgad point out in their recent critique of feminine confidence culture, the individualist discourse of self-empowerment, independent success, and the exhorting young women to ooze confidence, or even to fake it until you make it, has little effect on either gendered structural inequality in the workplace, or the still overpowering media and cultural messages that repeatedly tell young women to be pretty, slim, domestically competent, and sexually available. As Irish female writers, Nolan and Dolan may be more aware of the very recent history of gender restrictions around female sexuality and behaviour, given that abortion was only legalised less than four years ago in the Republic of Ireland, than some of their Western counterparts. Moreover, these writers, now in their 20s, were raised in the post-feminist but pre-2 90s and noughties when highly traditional modes of femininity in terms of the revival of a kind of ironic domesticity and a supposedly knowing and self-chosen, um, uh, very visible sexuality were a very strong presence in mainstream culture. In fact, as these texts make clear, given that kind of context and that history, the discourse of compulsory confidence when it's not <clears throat> supported by real social change or increasing opportunities, becomes, along with career failure and lower incomes, 
yet another source of acute in, and embarrassment and shame as Ava and the nameless heroine are painfully aware that their need to be loved and accepted is regarded by themselves as others and others as pathetic and demeaning. Okay, so, so, so finally here, what are we gonna make of these texts? Um, the question then becomes, do these texts share and disseminate this shame to readers as a kind of guilty pleasure, or do they offer the possibility of transformation? transformation? Um, do they need to offer the possibility of transformation to kind of relieve our discomfort? Um, like the text mentioned earlier by Marnie, they end on a somewhat ambivalent note. So as I've suggested, Eve, Ava runs to embrace Edith and the nameless heroine of acts of desperation seeks freedom in the ocean, wondering what life would be like without patriarchally inscribed female desires and aspiration. Um, and I would argue that in this sense, despite their lack of obvious closure, and none of them, neither of them seem to be particularly obviously sort of politicized or joining any kind of feminist activist groups or anything like that, they do end on a note of optimism through growing self-awareness and the rejection of a life masking their own desires in order to be desirable. Uh, as I say, Ava chooses a female lover and Nolan's heroine chooses the ocean. And I think one, may, one way we might read this is, is going back to um, some of the kind of theoretical notions, particularly coming from the work of critics such as Julia Kristeva and Helen Sisu on feminine writing. Yeah, um, The thing about the ocean, the fact that one of them chooses a female partner and kind of rejects this patriarchal setup, seems to evoke the older modernist feminist tradition of embracing the world of the body, of the feminine, of emotion, without neoliberal guilt, or at least um, at the level of the symbolic, without patriarchal constraints. And of course, just my final point, it does have the added advantage of humiliating and shaming the men who mistreated them in the process and being able to monetize that, which might not be an offer uh, option for all of us. Okay, so that's, that's me done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Our last uh, panelist, uh, is Claire Fisher and the author of All Good Things and How the Light Gets In. They live in Leeds where they teach creative writing and study for a PhD, which looks at queer theory, experimental writing and failure. Their work has been published um, in a number of places such as the London Magazine and Short Fiction. And you can find their uh, social media on the, uh, on the website with the abstracts. Uh, and the paper is titled Visibility, Vulnerability, and Power, Notes from the Margins of Writerly Womanhood. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say first, I really enjoyed both of those papers so much. Like obviously my PhD is looking at failure, practicing failure, uh, and having spent far too much time thinking about it uh, for the last few years. It's, it's really nice to hear other people's thoughts. And yeah, I, I'm really interested in, in, in all of the texts you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I will, I will get going on my paper, which is kind of a bit of a critical creative reflection. Um, I did intend to have some slides, but I did not get around to it. So apologies for that. Um, okay. For many years, I thought that getting published would make me feel like a successful and therefore a real writer. If I felt like a real writer, then my quieter and more absurd suspicion that I wasn't a real woman would disappear. Publication was, in other words, the object to which I attached my hopes of future wholeness. Of course, it didn't work out that way. I felt, in the wake of a deal with Penguin and multiple foreign rights deals, less real than ever. Did this, did this lead me to question my logic? Alas, it did not. Instead, I compared myself to more successful, i.e. more visible novelists, such as, yes, Sally Rooney. If only I could achieve that level of success, I would surely feel better. My attachment was, to borrow Lauren Balance words, and not for the last time, cruelly optimistic, in that my rigid attachment to it blocked the flourishing it supposedly promised. Still, I can't... 
anorexia, I had frequent panic attacks. In my day job as a marketing assistant, I failed to either perform the most basic tasks, such as mailing out brochures on time, or to explain my failure to do so. In contrast, the flow state, state into which I'd been able to submerge myself was writing the novel, in which everything, everything made sense. Suddenly, nothing did. Both of these people, the one who'd written the book and the one who could barely write emails, felt like rubbery simulations of what? Why was reality always somewhere else? Inevitably, I've been drawn over the past few years to the flourishing array of autofictional and autocritical texts by women writers consequences of making one's most private experiences so very public. I'll focus on a few of these here, illuminating the way in which the, the presentations of vulnerability intersects with what Valant calls a sentimental political culture, in which the formation of pain alliances across diverse subjects through the communication of some notion of a universal true feeling is advanced as the key tool for social change. I'll also draw on her notion of genre as an aesthetic structure of effective expectation, in particular, how women's writing operates along these lines as gendering machines, which promise membership and community aesthetically mediated performance of often tacit effective rules. I root my analysis in my positionality as a non-binary queer person who's both succeeded and failed to get published, who's white, middle class, and thus at times feels inside the category of woman and writer at others not. First, I'll talk about Olivia Sujic's Exposure, a book-length essay which illuminates much about how publication makes women writers vulnerable. Sujic explores her debilitating post-publication anxiety and alienation from her creative work through the prism of the anxiety epidemic and of the online disc writers as subjective. Writing and publishing a novel, she, she says, are antithetical experiences. Whilst writing is extremely private and awkward, publication and promotion are a lame bear that may be sudden and painful, even for someone fairly extroverted in their non-writing life. The period of anxiety which followed and in which she found it impossible to write felt, she says, like a more extreme version of the feeling of being constantly followed, observed, recorded that comes with online life and which inspired her to write the novel, The Paradox Magnified it. The internet promises us greater control over the self we expose to the world. It ends by leaving us more exposed than ever, particularly if you're a woman. And this is a quote from towards a, a passage towards the end of the book. Either you won't be believed or people will assume they know your life story. Either you're a narcissist or you don't know what you're talking about. Either you expose your myriad, contradictory, imperfect selves, or you conceal and dissemble and appear inauthentic or unrelatable when someone exposes it for you. Either you close yourself off from the world and grow more paranoid, or you join in, fall in love, risk, hurt. To publish a book in the conduit capitalism, Sujik suggests, is to be faced with an impossible task. Its patriarchal gaze renders women writers a failure from every conceivable angle. Her essay suggests that the hypervisibility and hypercriticality to which commercial success exposes the woman writer prevents her from accessing the vulnerability, the openness to risk and to hurt to propelled her to write in the first place. Sidgwick's text, text excited me not only for illuminating the structural components that fed into what I'd until then interpreted as a sign that I was also for its gathering of an archive of a feminist literary archive. Foremost among the um, foremost in the archive subject assembles is our Chris Krauss, Elena Ferrante, and Rachel Cusk. All examples of authors who perform female subjectivity as a refusal, refusal of patriarchal injunctions to expose oneself, but only in the correct way. They each trouble the assumption that women's writing is the easy and artless communication of their life. And as such, they, like Sujik, trouble the literary aesthetics as a means of troubling the effective rules underlying femininity as a genre. Cusk's outline trilogy, itself a response to the accusations that her previous memoir contained too much self, 
forces the reader to confront the blankness at the heart of female sh- subjectivity, argue subject, subject. Sophie Collins makes a similar argument in her, in her essayistic poetry collection, Who is Mary Sue? She highlights that Cusk's Cusk's ability to reveal the conspicuous lack of identity in the very place that has most often been tasked with generating readerly insensitive. Trying to stop reading public's appetite for this seeming revelation of identity, Cusk deliberately frustrates it. What becomes visible to the reader in this absence is the insatiability, perhaps even the unreasonableness of their own hunger. It is ultimately this archive of potential aesthetic and effective strategies that provides Sujik with a sense of safety and community necessary to re-establish ties with her own creative impulse. Here's another quote. When I was locked out of the familiar, reading those writers was like being welcomed by strangers. When I felt atomized and exposed, reading them was like being held in my head. I hope now to invite more female voices to the crowd. Here, Sajik wields feminist, advances the wielding of feminist vulnerability as a sentimental politics of sorts. When it's aestheticized in the right way, it promises membership to an imagined community, one in which you might be able to be yourself without risk being hurt. As Zambrino, who'd love to discuss here if I'd had time, who in Heroines describes how, whilst failing to publish or secure gainful employment as a lecturer, and thus feeling like something of an amateur writer, she says, I allowed myself to be cocooned in my little world with my dinner party of imaginary friends, the mad wives. Again, reading is protection that is necessary to keep writing. These texts illustrate much about the effective and aesthetic strategies that contemporary women writers are developing to protect their ability to remain creatively vulnerable in the hypervisible world into which publication thrusts them. But I'd like to put the political vision they invoke, particularly that which implies that writerly womanhood is a capacious category, fuzzily throwing its arms out to welcome everyone and anyone. These texts are all written by white women and the archives they assemble, archives of purported resistance, are almost entirely white, cis, straight and middle or upper class. Yet they're written as if the, let's face it, particular and particularly privileged problems these women encounter are somehow more general to the category of women. In doing so, the texts allow the women they are writing about and writing as to become, in opposition to the spectre of patriarchal domination, a sim- Discussions of mobility are limited to discussions of visibility. The writer's silences around their own entangled and contradictory relations to power foreclose the possibility of a broader discussion of vulnerability and its distribution in relation to power structures. Instead, there's a focus on individual performances of aesthetic control. Um, Although these individuals all feel like slightly different versions, the same slightly disappointed and disaffected middle-class white woman which I probably sometimes also <laughs> occupy that. Um, but I'd like to move now to discussing Mina Kandasamy's exquisite cadavers, cadavers, which certainly critiques the sentimental politics around women writers' vulnerability. First, I'd like to point out that the book received relatively little critical attention, particularly in comparison to the works mentioned above and other autofictional work by white women writers. In this way, the notion that women writer equals white upper class women writer is underscored. Like Cust's outline trilogy, the novel is an explicit reaction to the critical responses of her previous work, which Pigeon told it is a memoir. And here I'm quoting from her preface, sidestepping the entire artistic edifice on which the work stood and were instead solely defining me by my experience, raped Indian woman, beaten up white. Has is surreal in writing fiction which is as far from her own experience as possible an experience she visually confines to the margins of the pages and which distracts her from an intricate political reality yet Candace Stanley ultimately demonstrates a separating experience from fiction a ferentiality from autobiography the domestic from the political is not only destructive to her as a writer but ethically problematic She offers the reader a split page narrative in which they must constantly choose between the author's story, 
in the margins, which sometimes illuminates, sometimes undermines the fictional story at the centre. Includes material from Google's archives, quotations from critical and religious texts, and poetic anecdotes in the author's own life. This format registers the literary as implicated within surveillance capitalism's attention economy, in which the reader, much like in Cusk's outline trilogy, are constantly confronted with the implications of their aesthetic choices and appetites. She illuminates the violence of the, white, of the white gaze and how it constrains how she's read as a writer, as a woman, as a mother. She does not have access to the universal. Nor does she propose that the exposure of her feelings will lead to political transformation. Instead, the two narratives merge into a heartbreaking refrain, what's the worst, what's the worst that could happen? She illuminates the political limitations of sentimental politics as a form. She underlines how the literary does not necessarily intervene in power structures. In fact, it's complicit with them. And, a com and such a complicity is just as much, is shared just as much by the reader as it is the writer. Her novel therefore mobilizes the discussion of vulnerability away from visibility and towards an analysis of power. Kanda Sami's book points towards the importance of analysis of women writers and vulnerability. It also points towards the political limitations of equating vulnerability with visibility, in that it makes the revelation of fellow feeling into the only possible remedy, one which, through emphasising connection through sameness, and relatability erases difference. I would have liked to, to have talked about Anne Boyer's memoir, The Undying, in which she reframes the writer's constant exposure of their life sensory details as both necessary and damaging but definitely not as a source of political redress. And I quote, visibility doesn't reliably change the relations of power to who or what the visible is visible, except insofar as visible prey is a hunt. That's a reflection, I think, on, on what Sujik was writing about. Even if Sujik and the other feminist archives she invokes don't necessarily find alternatives to this. Could also have talked about Pretty Tanisha's aftermath a critical, creative exploration of terrorism, trauma, structural racism, and the political purposes of fiction and creative writing teaching. Success, she argues, is high visibility, the keys to a citadel, the seat of power. It's also, for the brown girl, the second generation working class kid, a form of passing. A quote, she thinks she can hide her skin under the cloak of straight A's. Yet, Tanisha also cautions the reader from trusting her confessional form too much. It too is a, is a fiction. It enables you, the reader, to be free with just pretty. That singularity is a fiction. I have to tell you, she writes, it is a narrative as lie. I began this talk with exactly this sort of lie and I can't tell whether you read my experiences as singular or as general. What I can say is that pity is not enough. Feelings are not enough. I'm not even sure that books are enough. Though I'd wish that I'd like them. What we need, I think, is to expand and complicate our archive of women writers beyond the same few names that name the same few experiences over and over. We need to expand our discussion of vulnerability to include a more critical analysis of how not only the writer but the reader are implicated in the power structures that so many of us are desperate to change. And that's, I'll just stop there. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to all of our presenters uh, for these very uh, rich papers that spoke so well to uh, to one another and to the um, paradoxical juxtapositions of both success and uh, and failure, particularly uh, in the neoliberal economies. Hello everyone and welcome to uh, the Rema Remapping the Self on uh, Vulnerable Bodies panel. I'm very happy to chair this session today. Uh, so as usual, I will be um, introducing the speakers before their papers uh, and we will save questions for the, uh, for the end, well, for after the presentations. Uh, so I will start uh, by introducing our first speaker. Uh, Regina Mosh is a filmmaker and PhD researcher at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, Scotland. 
She investigates the sensory expressions of traumatic memory in relation to co-creative experimental documentary. As part of her study, she works on a series of experimental documentary pieces of which what it felt like to dream fire is the first one. Uh, today, her paper is entitled The Artist Researcher as Vulnerable Object, Trauma and Agency in Experimental Documentary. Over to you, Regine. Yeah, thank you um, so much for this lovely introduction and also thank you so much to the organizers of this conference. It's been absolutely fantastic um, so far. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I've now sort of settled in the film area, um, but I've also studied literature to, during my undergrad, so I've really enjoyed um, going back to that yesterday um, as well. Um, can you see and hear me okay? And see my presentation? Yeah, fantastic. Cool, so yeah, um, in this uh, presentation today, I'll, I'll be presenting some early findings and early reflections um, on my research into, um, as Dominique said, uh, trauma, uh, traumatic memory and documentary film. Um, I'm in my first year, so this is like very, very sort of early on uh, in my, my, my journey. Um, and yeah, I come from an experimental um, filmmaking background, uh, which means I generally feel quite at home in all sorts of uh, strange territories and, and gray zones. Um, and that kind of makes me think I found a pretty go good home in practice research um, because there still seem to be quite a lot of um, gray zones and a lot of uh, undefined and, and unexplored um, territory as well. Um, so if we dive right in, um, I'm quoting just from the most recent uh, report from Bully and Shine on practice research, and they say that uh, practice research has the ability to reveal often unrecognized ways um, of knowing. Uh, and I connect to this quote because I researched the embodied um, knowledge um, of traumatic memory, um, especially of queer uh, trauma. Um, so it, indeed knowledge um, that often has no words and has no voice um, and arguably no representation. Um, it's maybe a kind of knowledge that actively destroys um, language and representation. Um, it's very ruptured and very complicated and often sits very deep inside the body. Um, now, through my practice um, in what I call um, experimental documentary film, uh, I'm trying to articulate this kind of knowledge, um, both through a sort of haptic imagery um, as devised by Laura Marx, um, and also through an expanded co-creative uh, process as well. Um, and it's not only that I want to kind of reveal or articulate um, this invisible knowledge, um, I also particularly want to sort of communicate the political complications and the entanglement and frictions that arise when you step into these vulnerable realms. Um, and I'm very heavily inspired by uh, Katrina Lindner, who tends so very intimately to these sticky, unruly, and entangled um, realms when bodies meet um, within a film, especially when queer bodies meet within a film. Um, within this larger project, um, I'm intending to work with other people uh, further down the line, um, but I've started off with a first piece, as Dominique said, um, uh, a first piece where I kind of turn the camera on myself um, and my own vulnerable experiences. And I guess sort of expose myself to this academic rigor um, that I plan to expose other people to uh, later on. Um, and it's this, this particular piece that I'm focusing on in this uh, presentation. Um, so basically, um, as you know, a broad range of scholars um, have found um, trauma, um, you know, ruptures our capacity to make sense uh, of the world. Um, it's something so big and so overwhelming um, that the process of uh, the, the brain often can't process it right in the moment, but sort of goes back to it in these delayed uh, manifestations in the body. Um, studying trauma, you know, is about the tensions between what is known and what is not known, what you can see and what you can't see, generally about this uncertainty of uh, truth. And as Anne Rutherford uh, says, trauma tears at the ex existential ground of existence in one's body. So I'm basically wondering what if this ruptured body, um, this vulnerable body basically belongs to 
the artist and researcher. Um, how can I do research about something within me um, that is hidden and unrecognized? Uh, and my primary method to explore this is this um, uh, photography, film, and sound piece, um, What It Felt Like to Dream Fire, which I co-created with a, a sound designer. Um, and to tell you a little bit about how this came about and about this um, artistic uh, process. Um, so the basis of the piece um, are a series of long exposure portraits, um, about four seconds long, uh, in which I retrace a traumatic experience I had about six years ago, where I um, thought I would almost lose someone, or I, I thought I would lose someone very close to me, um, right then from one moment to the next. Um, and in that period after, um, I was in this sort of constant state of uncertainty, of fear, of anxiousness and sleeplessness. And um, I had these very sort of intense um, nightmares, in particular one I remember so well where I had this like fiery, very scary kind of figure appear next to me. Um, and those I sort of tried to recreate in these portraits. I'm just going to show you um, a few of those. Um, and these dreams um, sparked by this experience that now sat in my body also kind of spilled over into my everyday life. Um, hence, I let this kind of transient texture of um, red spill over into these very kind of um, stage mundane um, everyday scenes um, that are pervaded by uh, this red line. Um, these images uh, also have a soundscape, but for the purpose of this, this Zoom conference, I, I'll just stick to the, these images. If anyone's interested in seeing the whole um, film, feel free to email me, I'm happy to, uh, to share it. Um, and uh, I should also say at the moment, we're also investigating different ways to screen this, to put it into kind of a spatial um, context. Um, sort of one uh, sort of traditional screening, but also going more into what's kind of to, uh, installation, video installation. Uh, setups. Um, so Jill Bennett, um, who's very influential for my research, um, says that, or she says about artworks that deal with trauma, that um, you know, rather than the object of memory, um, a process is registered, an attempt um, to find a language. So in my case, from experiencing this kind of pain and anxiousness um, <clears throat> and fear, I've tried to now put this into a kind of language to articulate it, utilizing this kind of haptic um, visuality. Um, now we have that, and what, what, what can this uh, language tell? What does it tell us? Um, I would say the haptic image on the one hand can make traumatic memory visible. So back then, obviously, um, nobody could really see what I went through. People might've seen that I've been anxious or sad or quiet, um, but not really see what I was carrying with me and probably not even I could really uh, articulate that at the time um, or describe it. Um, so it also um, kind of helps me um, to find a visualization to look at it um, and, and to reflect on it. Also, um, this haptic image shows the different modes of being uh, of a traumatic state. So I'm in this world now here, of course, um, but this memory has sort of put itself um, on top of me, kind of like a skin. Um, sometimes it's just this sort of red line that pervades sort of my being, but sometimes it's an entire sort of film in, in the sense of cling film that um, lies on top of me. Um, and also I would say that the haptic image can kind of reveal, reconstruct and reawa reawaken um, these bodily sensations of a traumatic memory. Um, and there was a very interesting moment um, in the creative process um, of this piece, because uh, the way Brian, uh, the sound designer, and I worked when creating the sound um, was that I didn't give them any directions or moods or instructions for their composition, as I would maybe usually do um, for creating sound to a film. Um, I also wouldn't tell them exactly what had actually happened. We sort of very consciously, very intentionally agreed that we would um, entirely communicate through these images or rather through this knowledge that has gone into these images. Um, and they would work rather intuitively 
um, than me interfer interfering or correcting um, their, their creations. And what came out of it was really quite impactful um, for me um, because the first time I listened to the first draft of the first piece um, or, or watched it, um, I actually had to put my headphones down uh, for a moment because it sort of got too much. Like I started to physically feel um, dizzy and, and slightly nauseous. And I'm, I must honestly say, I'm not entirely sure um, what that means exactly, other than that we captured something um, through that process um, that came from my body and sort of made its way through images and sound and ended up, again, affecting my own body um, pretty strongly. Um, which brings me to, again, uh, Jill Bennett. Um, and she says, the registration of effect, effect is neither an end in itself, nor simply the measure of art's capacity to represent already felt sensation. It is rather a manner of doing politics. Um, and I, I feel this quote is a kind of good segue into my second part, because um, on the one hand, it, it summarizes my haptic documentary practice that sort of sways away from narrative, <clears throat> narrative uh, representation. Um, and on the other hand, it kind of um, brings us to how this relates to doing politics. Um, and uh, I would say that, um, you know, making something vulnerable, visible in an artistic process is inherently political um, because it raises the question of who is speaking about whom, who is expressing this vulnerability, um, in which way, under what circumstances. And yeah, Joe Bennett and I, I know that many other people too call this the, the politics of uh, representation. And um, <clears throat> usually these politics are about sort of a vulnerable object, then an artist kind of representing this vulnerable object. Sometimes maybe they're the same. And then you have a researcher who kind of reflects and investigates this captured vul vulnerability in this piece. And the intricate thing about what it felt like to dream fire is that these identities um, merge um, or actually maybe collide quite violently um, because they're all in this one vulnerable body that, that belongs to me. So here, I think trauma really provokes this dichotomy between object, <clears throat> artist and uh, researcher. Um, yeah, because this knowledge about what I just said before, the haptic image and, and uh, traumatic memory did not come from me as a transcendental observer, but actually from kind of within the embrace of this um, embodied filmmaking. And in that, I think it, it challenges the notions of documentary agency or the even research agency um, or authority. How do we deal with that or how do I deal with that um, in, in my case here? Um, I think again, it's the haptic image that actually takes <clears throat> a center stage or a key role. Because in a public uh, email or pub published email conversation um, with two uh, theater dramaturgs in Zurich, Laura Marx um, says that uh, the pol politics of haptic visuality are that it opens up the beholder and makes them more vulnerable to the world. It's no longer a hierarchical relationship. Um, <clears throat> but one of mutuality. And I would argue um, that it's not only the beholder or the spectator that is made more vulnerable um, to the world, but it's also um, the artist slash researcher. Um, because crucially, looking back at this creative process, um, what is, that, what is decisive is that even from my position as a researcher, you know, reflecting on everything, I sort of open myself up to the image. You know, I become vulnerable myself. Um, and the thing is that something sort of really intense, something very effective, you know, has happened when we don't put these identities sort of on top of each other, but actually next to each other and let them speak to each other, you know, rather than about each other. And uh, yeah, and I would argue even that, you know, I can manage to sort of restore my agency through this kind of uh, creative process and through this hapt haptic image, not necessarily to make definitive representations and this, this definitive 
kind of statements about trauma, about trauma, what it feels like, um, but to communicate these very <clears throat> tensions themselves. Um, and so I propose that um, agency, you know, does not necessarily em em emerge through, you know, authority, but it, it emerges at these in-between spaces, you know, of my identities. Of course, that means that meaning and agency, in this case, emerges in the class, in the doing, in my practice. And <clears throat> importantly, um, this new sense of political agency that I'm kind of seeking out um, is not only about what we can voice or what we can do or what we can express um, in the way we want to, but also where we can feel what we want to in the way we want to for the reasons we do, you know, and um, it's this sort of sensory notion um, that creates the political discourse. Um, yeah, to sum up, um, in my kind of practice research, I'm, I'm looking at film as a space of bodily and political negotiation and a space that sort of pushes and rearranges my agency as an artist um, and as a researcher. Um, and a space that sort of gives weight to the silence and to the vulnerability as a source um, of agency as well, which again lets me arrive at um, Lindner, um, who puts this so beautifully, uh, in my opinion. Um, my own embodiedness, inescapable, <clears throat> my own embodiedness as inescapable as it is, makes me part of a wider network of embodied connections and relations rather than the detached and disembodied voice of authority. And I suppose what I want to get at, um, where, where I want to take this, um, you know, further down the line is um, to take this way of thinking about an artistic process to working co-creatively with other people. So what will we be able to communicate? And what kind of effective <clears throat> transformation can we instigate um, if we allow these boundaries to, you know, these boundaries between object artist and researcher to collide, maybe even to collapse? Um, and let par participants have this sensory kind of agency over experience, over expression, um, and also over investigation. Um, thanks. That was, that was that. Thank you very much, uh, Regina, for this wonderful presentation. Um, as I said, well, a round of virtual applause indeed. And as I said, we'll take, we'll take questions at, um, after the presentation. So I will now introduce our second, uh, our second speaker. Um, Kath Catherine Gove Brady is an award-winning documentary producer and director who publishes on the emergent use of video as a method of academic discourse and the relational nature of documentary production processes in journals, including media practice and education, Screen Works, In Transition, the International Journal of Creative Media Research and Cultural Geographies. She is currently co-editing co an um, edited book of essays on the intersection between creative practice and theory. Catherine produced and directed six ABC TV documentary series, including Legal Briefs in uh, 2016 and Ethics Matters in 2017. Catherine created 11 radio features for ABC Radio uh, National. Catherine is currently in post-production uh, on a TV half hour for ABC TV called The Communicator. Catherine is a head of postgraduate studies at uh, JMC Academy in Australia and is an associate editor of Screen Works. Her paper today is entitled Creating 70 plus film production process as relational acts. Over to you, uh, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, um, I just want to say, Regina, I really loved um, your work uh, and uh, your presentation. That was very interesting. And I'm going to continue with a little bit of Laura Marx. So there'll, there'll be some connections, uh, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I come to academia later in life and I'm a filmmaker. Uh, and so um, what that means is that um, at these types of events, I make an essay film and I share it with you, right? Rather than me going blah, 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 because that would not be as interesting, I think. Um, so what I'm gonna do, because you know the internet's not that awesome, um, it's pretty good, but when it comes to sharing film, um, it's a bit glitchy. Um, so I've popped a, um, in the chat a Vimeo link, it's 11 minutes. So my suggestion is um, 
that you head off, press it, hopefully it just opens and plays for you. Um, turn off your microphone if you've got it on, which is probably just me. Um, and we come back uh, in 11 minutes and move on to the next talker and then we can chat about it um, afterwards. Uh, I know that sounds a bit weird, um, but it would be awesome if we could do that. Um, so I'll um, let everyone head off. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine, for sharing this wonderful piece with us. So we'll save questions for the uh, for after the last presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, well, then I will introduce uh, our final two uh, panelists, co-panelists, uh, Caroline Verdier and Beth Kearney. Uh, so Caroline Verdier is a lecturer in French uh, at the University of, of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Her research interests include contemporary French and Francophone literature, in particular, Belgian women writers. She is also interested in issues surrounding cultural identities in Francophone countries and currently works on contemporary Francophone illness narratives. Beth Kierne is a PhD candidate in French studies at the University of Queensland, where she is working on a thesis on the role of photography in contemporary women's life writing in French. Her research interests include modern and contemporary women's writing and visual art with an emphasis on interactions between text and image. She serves as postgraduate representative and communications officer for women in French Australia and teaches French and Francophone language and culture at the University of Queensland. Their paper is entitled um, Taming, Remapping and the Vulnerability of the Cancerous Bodies. Over to you. Uh, Caroline and Beth. Thanks so much, Dominique. Um, I'd just like to apologize for a bit of an inconsistency in the bio that I gave you. Um, last year I was doing my PhD and this year I've taken a break from my PhD to teach um, full-time at the University of New England. So if anyone was wondering about the, the change in biography, um, maybe you didn't notice either way. So um, thanks so much. Can everyone see my screen? Is that, is that all good? So contemporary women uh, writers of French expression are increasingly incorporating images into their life narrative. Uh, in a 2013 article, Shirley Jordan describes uh, a visual verbal experiment in contemporary women's writing in French. And she explains that this phenomenon brings into question the strong role that the scopic realm, so the act of looking, plays in relation to how one views the self. Um, it may be said that women indeed have a particularly troubled relationship with the gaze and that they're particularly vulnerable to the power of the scopic, the power that the scopic may have on their understanding of self. Today in our paper, Caroline and I would like to show how this phenomenon emerges in illness narratives by women authors of French expression. We're currently working on a project together that compares at least two contemporary life narratives. The project focuses on the work of Lydia Flem and Anne Wolfer, and both of these works, or both of the works that we're studying, are semi-autobiographical, uh, they might also be referred to as autofictional or perhaps even auto, uh, autopathographies. Each in her own way, the author represents her experience of breast cancer treatment using autobiographical text and images together. In both narratives, text and images jointly express bodily suffering and vulnerability, as well as the narrator's complex, uh, complex relationship with the medical environment in which she receives her treatment. So while we're seeking to broaden our corpus, the two examples that we discussed today show that the image is mobilized in such a way as to offer a different way of looking at and a different way of considering the cancerous body. And this is um, a perspective that differs from the more clinical, uh, objective and sometimes alienating medical gaze uh, experienced in a hospital environment. <clears throat> so both authors uh, created images during treatment. While Flem took photographs, Wolfgang made drawings, as you can see in the examples on our slide. Flem's autofictional novel, La Reine Alice, which translates to Queen Alice, uh, is a textual accompaniment to certain photographs in her catalogue, Journal Amplicit, that I'm including just a few examples on this, on this slide. So Flem's phototextual work portrays the author's experience of breast cancer treatment through the metaphor of Alice in Wonderland. The protagonist, Alice, like Flem herself, takes photographs to tame bad luck. 
but is to use creativity as a regenerative and cathartic tool when faced with corporeal suffering. The second work in our corpus is by Anne Wolfell, and the book Le Doute, uh, which translates to doubt, uh, is a book comprised of a series of autobiographical drawings, with each drawing being, ex being an expression of her holistic suffering during treatment. Each drawing is accompanied by a short title that in part elucidates the meaning behind the images. Like Flem, Wolfell creates images to tame what we all fear. So both of the authors are referring to their, their breast cancer diagnosis here. The female body at the heart of, this, um, of both of these hybrid autophotographies is weakened by cancer surgery and treatment. Uh, each, uh, each woman is exposed to invasive medical imaging procedures and examined from all angles by medical professionals. Both authors thus focus heavily on corporeal vulnerability within a medical environment during treatment, while also striving to achieve a degree uh, of autonomy through creativity and through the act of uh, making autobiographical images. And I can see some, some overlaps with Regina's work here, which I look forward to discussing. Um, <clears throat> Although the images created by Flem and Wolfers are by no means identical to one another, they do deviate from what a traditional or a purely textual uh, narrative achieves. They both use images alongside text to portray their bodily experience and corporeal vulnerability within the medical environment. In our examination of these two books, we focus on the specific role that the image plays for each author. We consider that the image, as well as the process of image making, achieves something for each author that the written word alone cannot. And the image is intricately bound uh, to her bodily suffering in a sense of disorientation and alienation within the medical environment. And I'd just like to take this opportunity um, to say that it's really great that we're in a panel alongside two artists because um, we might have an opportunity to talk about what the image does for you in particular as opposed to other media. Um, I, I find that really interesting. Um, so our preliminary argument uh, for this project is that the visual aspects of these two autophotographies work to remap the body. So this idea of remapping the body is the term that we use to explain each author's attempt to reorient herself when she feels lost and confused by the medical environment. Remapping the body occurs when the authors uh, use different kinds of image making in an attempt to escape the sense of self-alienation that may emerge from bodily suffering and from the clinical objective gaze that doctors necessarily cast on their patients. Remapping the body we argue, represents an author's attempt to refine herself when she feels alienated by her own body, a body which is weakened, which is failing her, and which she feels is objectified by the gaze of medical pr practitioners. By creating images, Flem and Wolfers offer a more holistic means of understanding bodily experience, each seeking to relocate her selfhood. So before Caroline um, uh, examines our case studies more closely, I'll give a brief overview of our theoretical approach. <clears throat> the medical gaze uh, was first theorized by Michel Foucault uh, in The Birth of the Clinic in 1963. Um, in coining this term, the philosopher describes the kind of objective and clinical gaze that emerges within the context of scientific medicine. And he argues that the gaze targets the disease or ailment rather than the patient in a holistic sense. The medical gaze tends to overlook the fact that the patient is a living, uh, feeling and thinking individual. The medical gaze reduces the patient to their disease rather than acknowledging their embodied experience. Foucault questions this approach uh, to medicine, writing that in order to look to um, sorry to look in order to know, to show in order to teach, is not this a tacit form of violence, all the more abusive for its silence upon a sick body that demands to be comforted, not displayed. Similarly, in uh, Phenomenology of Illness, Harvey Carroll reflects on the fact that with diagnosis comes the realization of one's own vulnerability. And he writes that um, illness affects one's entire way of being. The narrow medical view of illness cannot capture these dramatic and intimate uh, changes to one's life and being. I'll just mention one more scholar, I don't wanna bore you with this, but um, this one's quite important. Um, Susan Greenhouse, who's a contemporary scholar, writes um, similarly about the disjunct between clinical knowledge and patient experience. And she does so most notably in her book, Under the Medical Gaze. She agrees with Foucault that the clinical and alienating nature of the medical gaze can often be unhelpful and even painful for patients. But importantly, she recognizes that more objective clinical approaches to the body and disease are also a necessary aspect of the healing process. Greenhouse finds a balance between acknowledging the necessity of a medical gaze 
and the difficulties that flow from it. <clears throat> and she writes that most of us think that medicine can reveal the truth of our body because medicine is a science that claims to have direct privileged access to the truths of nature. But does scientific medicine convey the truth in capital letters or only a truth of our body? So for our project um, on remapping the body, Caroline and I suggest that the subtle effects of the medical gaze are at work in our corpus because both Flem and Wolfers portray their extreme sense of alienation from their bodies during breast cancer treatment and their fight against this loss of selfhood within a clinical environment. Both authors actively seek to offer another truth regarding their bodies. And if, as Greenhouse suggests, the medical gaze claims to prescribe the truth of a disease body, and there are potentially many truths of the body, we argue that Flem and Wolfers use their narratives in an attempt to offer qualitative and embodied truths in the plural. <clears throat> Therefore, while the doctors represented in our corpus, uh, or in these two works, uh, do the important work of extricating the cancerous disease from the body, each author uses creativity to relocate her sense of self. And I'll hand it over to Caroline now. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'll move on to the kind of case studies uh, for, for this project. So um, can you move on to the next Oh, no, not yet, Beth. sorry, no, not yet, <laughs> sorry. So though, um, each author um, uses a different visual medium and, and creates images in radically different styles, both use creativity, we argue, as a means of catharsis. That is, each author uses creativity to express herself rather than allow herself to be swept into a constant state of apathy. Image creation is a common distinctive feature of their works, and it is used to overcome their sense of helplessness, loss of control, and vulnerability. As argued by Ox and Caps, narrative is, I quote, an essential resource in the struggle to bring experience to conscious awareness. Now, if we take a annual fair first, thank you, Beth. Um, Drawing is our primarily means of dealing with what she describes as, I quote, doubt, fear, waiting, and anxiety. She published our first visual narrative in 2012 when dealing with depression. Um, during this depression, daily drawing became an essential means for her to make sense of her emotions, playing a therapeutic role in her recovery. Drawing was a means of expression that helped her to record her life and her experiences. It was a cathartic way to express her highs and her lows. Thus, when diagnosed with breast cancer, Wolfer almost naturally returned to pen and paper to document her physical and psychological journey as a patient, as well as her interactions with the doctors. She writes, I quote, I had my pilgrim staff, my notebook and my pen. Importantly, we notice that drawing is a particularly appropriate means of catharsis because it's likely to have taken less cognitive effort than traditional writing would have, as is the case we will see uh, later on also with uh, Flem's photography practice. In Le Dout, however, Wolfer's drawings document daily experiences during the four months of a cancer journey, from the initial suspicion of cancer to diagnosis, and throughout the treatment process itself, including her surgery and her radiotherapy treatments. Apart from the opening of the book, which contains a page long poem, each page contains a drawing and a brief annotation representing a day on Wolfer's breast cancer journey, as you can, as you can see on the, on the slide. So there are kind of uh, quite a few examples here of, of the drawings. Now let's look at, at a few uh, examples more precisely. Um, Wolfer uses irony uh, throughout her work, and her dense, her dark sense of humor emerges throughout her, the interaction between text and image. In the vast majority of these examples, uh, one is unable to deduce the meaning of the text or of the image alone, but together they depict Wolfer's perspective and experience. Many of the text drawing couplets allow Wolfers at once to represent a place in the medical environment and express as well how she feels in this situation. In many images, there is a stark contrast between the clinical reality of her situation and a complicating feelings surrounding it. 
The two images here, for example, depict a very crude reality of Wolfer's body. In both drawings, she's nude. These self-portraits may be read as means of expressing the fact that she had lost all selfhood. A nudity erases the markers of individuality and personality. In other words, uh, Wolfers show that she felt as, the, as though she was not a holistic individual, but rather a medical subject reduced to not to reduced, sorry, not only to her body parts, but to her diseased body parts. And we noticed that her breasts, the location of her disease, are prominently depicted here. The idea of lost selfhood is also reiterated by the small headings of, uh, for the two images, which respectively read, and I'm going to give you a translation in English, as um, I am putting you in complete menopause, for je vous mets en menopause totale, and um, vision the operation at the Cavell hospital, hospital, sorry, for the other. The statement foreground a medical practitioner's perspective, to go back to our theoretical frame, uh, as she's seen as no more than her body parts, and specifically the body parts associated with her hormones as she endures breast cancer treatment. Welfare thus expresses her self-alienation during uh, the medical treatment, the medical experience. It is important to note that she was, of course, grateful to the doctors for saving her lives, and she ind indeed actually dedicated uh, the book uh, to them. Simultaneously, however, these text image couplets show that throughout the treatment, she felt that she was reduced to her diseased body parts, as I've already said. The relationship between text and image is very often a source of irony as Wolfer's dark, dark sense of humor makes light of the uncomfortable realities of the situation. I will now take uh, this, this image uh, as, my, as my final example on, on Anne Wolfer. Uh, it is an image of a woman beheaded. We may firstly choose to interpret this uh, as another means of communicating the author's sense of lost selfhood, as the mind is arguably tied to a person's personality and as it is the origin of their opinions and sense of humor, for example. But there is an additional message here. The text below the image may be translated as what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And the irony here stems from the fact that a decapitated, a decapitated woman is clearly injured and not stronger after having lost her head. Yet another more literal message emerges here. Breast cancer treatment necessarily kills cells in the body, which in turn harms the body. And yet, it is the process of killing parts of the body through breast cancer treatment that will actually hopefully save the body. And I will now uh, move on to um, uh, Lydia Flem for the second set of, uh, of examples. So if Wolfer already used drawing in the past to help her with her mental health, Flem had not used photo and text together before. Uh, and and it's, uh, as you may have seen already, it's a very different uh, set of um, uh, images that both are working with. Confronted with breast cancer as a new challenge in her life, Lydia Flem found an alternative way of dealing with it. And in addition to writing La Reine Alice, uh, she documented her journey through photography. When treatment and extreme fatigue prevented her from writing, she decided to take pictures instead. You will notice that in contrast to Wolfer's images, uh, Flem's photographs are mostly vibrant and colorful. In these images, Flem represents her experience in a light-hearted and often comical or playful manner. Her experimentation with vibrant compositions may appear to have no link with her cancer. And as the vibrant, colorful palette uh, in these images appears to be a deliberate attempt to reimagine the experience in a more positive term, in more positive terms, sorry. These colorful photographs evoke an attempt to seek joy and have a positive view on the situation. Bright colors symbolize our attempt to escape the harsh reality of treatment and to overcome the sense of helplessness and vulnerability that stems from the fact of being a cancer patient. This image is reinforced in the novel, which contains many implicit jokes as well. Like Anne Wolfer, then, Flem shows that self-expression was a means of surviving the treatment. 
What, when verbal modes of expressions were too challenging due to extreme weakness induced by the treatment, um, image making offered another more positive avenue. As such, Flem writes in a book of photographs that, I quote, these photographs were born from a necessity to create an imaginary world, to anchor ourselves in reality again, to transform pain into beauty, uncertainty into momentum. In a novel that she wrote after she uh, recovered from treatment, uh, Flem evokes the strained relationship she had with writing during her treatment. The novel uh, positions the protagonist, Alice, as a person who, uh, in moments of distress and disorientation, longed for, I quote, neither speech or writing, but only for the creation of images. Writing requires availability, such availability, such patience, whereas the image is, da is dazzling, sorry, whereas the image is a dazzling moment that offers its power in an instant, end of quote. Flem's narrator, Alice, explained that she welcomes the instantaneous nature of the photographic image, an act which offers instant gratification and catharsis, as opposed to the cognitive exertion that writing demands. Like welfare, Flem does not need to exert much cognitive or intellectual effort with image making, as opposed to writing, which demands that the author writes in a coherent, logical, and in particular, linear manner. And linearity here is not necessarily required to create photographs. In the images that you can see on the slide, to take just a few examples, you will note that the text is also part of the compositions. But the words are out of order, they are jumbled on the page, and the image thus depicts words and literature in a way that evokes the, the narrator's cognitive fatigue. These jumbled and non-linear compositions portray the narrator's sense of disorientation when confronted with written words. I will take one final example before concluding uh, now. And uh, this, is, uh, this photograph is a collage of paintings depicting women with turbans on their heads. The women are pensive and they appear peaceful as well. They offer a stark contrast to the distress that Flem's narrator experiences during her treatment. This photograph is, however, a direct reference to Flem's novel, in which she describes the narrator as la dame au turban, um, that is to say in English, the turban woman. She uses this term to reference the fact that she wore fabric around her head uh, to cover her hair loss. And this image may, may thus be read as an attempt to achieve the calm, peaceful, and philo philo philosophical sorry, composure of these other women in the history. So to conclude, uh, the notion of remapping the body is a key concept that we develop around these two illness narratives, whereby the visual image is a key means for each writer to relocate a sense of self throughout various portrayals of the self. The visual image must assist her in finding her bearings and at a time when she felt she feels lost. Creativity acts as a form of catharsis and humor and positivity offer means of escapism from their challenging experience. Image making allows each author to re-visualize her own body and achieve a sense of agency because she seeks to escape the limiting, objectifying, invasive nature of the medical gaze. Rather than understand their bodies in purely medical terms and be defined by the objective and clinical nature of the medical gaze, the authors find another way to represent their experiences and their selves. Arthur Frank indeed writes that illness narratives, whatever their chosen medium, or I quote, also a care of the self, a practice of reclaiming a voice that bodily trauma and institutional treatment have caused to be silenced. Flem's and Wolfer's respective visual art practices allows them to show and to see what is hidden. The medical gaze is unable to account for the holistic experience of a patient, um, such as fears or suffering or vulnerabilities, as well as a joy or intimate relationships or creativity. In remapping the body through the visual image, the female subject relocates her sense of selfhood and despite her disorientated relationship with the body and the medical space, she manages to find herself again. 
Thank you very much. Well, thank you both for this wonderful presentation. Um, I, I've just popped in the chat, I think someone that you might be interested in, um, she's a Melbourne photographer from the city I'm in, uh, who photographed her death. Um, and, and it's interesting because she looks like she's pregnant in the images, but she's just pregnant with the disease. Um, and it kind of contains some images that I think are almost like Lacan's words as photographs. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. That looks most interesting. Um, and Sandra, you raise your hand, so please. Go ahead. What, a, what a wonderful panel to get us started on day two. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. I took so many notes and I've got a question. And the question was sort of prompted by Regina's paper. Uh, but I think that I think it applies to all of you. So feel free to sort of pitch in if 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 you had ideas on it. And Regina, in your paper, you discussed about, you know, kind of who we see on camera, what sort of bodies we 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 see. So I was just wondering, kind of following that 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 question of who is represented and who does the representing of who is listening as well. So I was just wondering if in your practice or in your research, you've thought at all about the uh, politics of reception when it comes to discourses of trauma or narratives of trauma. So, but I think that that's valid. Uh, the, the idea of politics of reception, I think it's, you know, feel free to bring in any thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Sandra, also for these very kind words. Um, I, I have made a start on kind of looking into that, but I've not gone into a lot of depth, but that's sort of on like the agenda for, for the next two years. I think once you start screening that kind of work, may, that's sort of the next step to kind of yeah, when you screen it to an audience, um, to other people who are maybe not related to the topic or to me. Um, yeah, what that kind of haptic imagery, um, kind of what kind of effect that has on people. Um, so I'm very, very keen and I, I'm, yeah, I must look into that more. Um, and I think, I mean, Laura Marx has very, um, very interesting thoughts on that. I think that that also takes a big part of her work on the skin of the film. But I think she, I've, I've read um, sort of a couple of interviews or, or papers that she wrote after. Um, and I think there's, you know, that can go in all sorts of directions in all sorts of media, um, not only the video works that she describes in, the work, in, in, in her book, uh, but also to theatre, for example, or sound installations and, and all that kind of thing. So I'm happy to hear from, from the others if, if there are any other um, ideas on that. Um. You know, I watch people watch my films, right? So the people who left the cameras on, I watched and I made notes. Um, and um, at um, about 6.31, so that would be eight minutes into the film, quite a few people touch their noses. And so I'm intrigued to go back and go, oh, what happens at eight minutes? Why do people do this? Um, and was it like, you know, was it a mimicking of something on the screen or, or was it a sense of wanting to feel your own skin or something? I'm not sure. Yeah. But I think I think we have an effect uh, on audiences and, and I think it is an embodied effect. Yeah. Thank you both for your for your answers. Um, I think. Christine was uh, with next. Um, thank you. Um, really incredibly interesting panel. Um, two things. Regina, I'd super love to see your work because uh, it's so um, so interesting. So I'd love to see it uh, not just as a photograph, but in a film piece. So I don't know if maybe you could share your email and if you just want to yep. individually send it to people. You can send me an email, I'm happy to. Yeah. Oh, I don't know your email. That's all. Yeah, um, I'll pop it in the chat. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, and Catherine, um, gorgeous piece. I've, I've, I've seen the film that you then do the digital story about. Uh, I find the um, filming of your mother's skin incredibly confronting and I, and I wondered um, how you were thinking you were gonna use that in your original version of the film and you know how your mum feels about those images as well. Yeah, I mean, I, um, so, we had set out with the idea of the wrinkles as landscapes. So, so there was a sense that, you know, 
that was the game. Um, and, and yeah, I think there's this thing, isn't there? You know, like her neck, it's just like, wow, it's like troughs and, and furrows and it's just amazing. Um, and so, and there is a sense in which we're not meant to look like that. Um, and we're meant to be unhappy about that. Um, but I don't know. I think Tess has the ability because she's a writer to be able to distance her self image from the filmed kind of version of things. She didn't, she wasn't at all upset. And I'm trying to remember where we used them in the original cut because, like, basically that film was made from shots from the film that never got made, the one that got hit the cutting room floor. Um, uh, and, and yeah, sorry, I just can't remember what the text was um, at that point. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer on, on that one. But um, it was really interesting to do it. Um, and I do love those images and I love the, but I stole actually. So I, I know Christine. So this, you know, <laughs> um, um, and we've actually made some films together. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the elbow shot, right? Like that. I actually stole that from, remember that guy from America um, who came in and did that and had that lovely piece about um, wolves? Oh, yes, dad. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a shot in there and I, and it was that shot and I was just like, that's an awesome shot. I'm going to do that one day. Um, yeah. So I, I can't take um, original idea credit for that one. Well, I when I saw those um, on her neck and then you were filming in Egypt and I remember being mm. at the pyramids and looking up at the sand dunes and the sand oh, dunes yeah. fold in that same way and are almost kind of like that colour. And uh, yeah. anyway, that's just a random... Yeah, thing. yeah. No, you're right. It is a <laughs> desert colour, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, where we were, there weren't actually sand dunes. Um, uh, it was kind of more... Um, it, we, we stuck pretty close to the Nile. Um, but, yeah... Um, Actually, that's interesting because I am going to head out and film sand dunes in a couple of weeks' time. So. Well, you might be scrabbling, get that shot back out of the bin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It was really great. It was really great for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a request in the chat from Pooja who was asking all of our panellists for a recommendation. Um, on readings uh, about disease and, and bodies. Um, and our next question uh, will be from Adina. Hi, um, I have a question for Regina. It's a really big question, so I really apologize for this. Um, so um, I've been working with trauma studies since the early days of my, of my PhD and my approach to trauma studies has, has somehow shifted. So we had this quote about how trauma is a rupturing of the capacity to, I think it was to understand the world, if I'm not mistaken. And I was wondering whether um, we're not always at odds with, with understanding the world. And I was wondering if the experience of, of trauma um, doesn't lay bare this very dissonance that we're experiencing. And I'd really love to see your movie as well. So, <laughs> uh, email. Yeah, um, I think, I think you're right. Um, it, yeah, it's, I think um, it drops the, the capacity to make, make sense of the world, which is more or less the same, I would say. Um, and I mean, I think there, there is this, there, there are these sort of slightly older, um, uh, trauma or cultural trauma scholars from the 80s, 90s that, that do say that, you know, there is this clear cut of this traumatic experience happening and then your mind or your brain being completely overwhelmed by it. And there's this sort of dichotomy between what happened and then what your mind thinks happened and tries to work out what happened and that you can't really make sense of, of it anymore. But there are, there are more recent um, cultural trauma scholars who also say, well, it's not really that, you know, you can't make sense of the world anymore, but there's a new way of making sense of it. So they, they, they kind of break up this dichotomy a little bit of this truth or this, this event that happened. And then your mind making sense or not being able to make sense of it anymore. Um, so they say, actually, you know, that rupturing actually um, offers all sorts of new po possibilities to find new ways of making sense of the world and 
um, finding new understandings that probably precisely come from this vulnerability that is in your in your body. And I think that's very interesting. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear more about those references. So I'll email you. Oh Thank yeah, you. I, I can pop them in the chat. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you both, uh, Lydia. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you all very much for that. It was fascinating and wonderful, and, and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is actually quite similar to Adina's, so I guess I will put it to um, Catherine and Beth and Caroline as well. I was just kind of noting that, that over the course of these presentations, there seemed to be this kind of running idea that trauma was both this thing that ruptures and also something kind of quote unquote productive or 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 creative or or constitutive of, of people's experience. And I just wondered if that was something that you had thought about when you were kind of making and writing these um presentations. Um yeah. Shall I pop in first? So you know I'm a doco maker and um I not infrequently film other people's trauma. Um, and you know you know not they always trauma traumatized in the you know but we capture those moments in amongst the other moments as well um and so it was really interesting for me to experience you know i don't know if it's trauma or extreme stress but i think it was quite like i was very freaked out about we were almost stuck in egypt um and uh I couldn't film it, like I had no interest in picking up the camera. Um, I was just worried about solving the problem. Uh, and so I actually found that really interesting that, um, and so I'm intrigued also then um, with Regina, like you, you're doing this after, like reflecting on the trauma, but were you filming it at the same time as it was going on as well, you know, related to it? Because I, yeah, I couldn't do that. Um, for I, I think, and, and Beth, feel free to to jump in at any point. I, I think in 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 what we've been looking at uh, for Flem and and for Wolfer, um, the trauma I would say has been the catalyst almost for creativity. Uh, this is really. Um, for, for welfare, uh, the, the kind of trauma of depression for the first time basically, you know, triggered the, the, the start of the drawings. She, she's an artist, uh, she's a, a, a graver, you know, she's kind of an engraver, um, a job. And I think it, it's really, um, yeah, the experience, the traumatic experience has been a, a catalyst for her to start writing and that she's repeated the process then when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and in the case of Flem, uh, I think she was taking photographs before Beth, but I think this, um, this project of, um, uh, of um, taking pictures during the treatment was really triggered by the fact that she could not use the usual means that she was using um, to express herself the writing, and then she turned to photography. But Beth, I think you wanted to add something, yeah. Um, yeah, I just add, um, for, for Lydia Flem, it was quite a new practice. It was something she was unfamiliar with. So it was really this, this kind of starting from ground zero, just because writing demanded so much of her, it took so much of her energy and she didn't feel capable. Um, and I think um, wait, Caroline and I are yet to explore this further, but we're considering also adding to our corpus a book by um, uh, an author called Camille Reynaud. She's, um, she, it's just a um, kind of like a first person novel, but she's actually a photographer. And when she became really sick, all of a sudden she did the opposite, she turned to writing. So it's almost like um, not, not quite, um, with Wolfers, but with these other two um, authors slash artists, it was interesting that they that they became very sick unexpectedly, and that trauma, that challenge, that kind of being pushed to the brink of contemplating one's own mortality, meant that they did something radically new. Um, and I think there's something really interesting about that. They didn't they they didn't feel like they were able to fall back on their usual coping mechanisms. Um, so I think that's a really great. Uh, um, kind of contrast that you bring up, Lydia. I think it's a really good way of putting it. Um, yeah, and it, it can be generative as, at the same time that it's breaking things down. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Thanks for your question. 
I think I'm wondering should... also, sorry, just um, ahead, whether Catherine. it's to do with chronic or an acute, you know, in a sense, um, the trauma of the people you introduce us to is a chronic illness. Um, and so I wonder if there's something like you have time to then go, okay, I'm, I have to deal with this. So it has to become a part of me as an artist. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I actually haven't thought about it in those terms. That's a really good thing to bring in. Um, I think it's different for each of them. I think with something like, um, I, I would need to look into it myself so that I have a better understanding of chronic and acute. But um, for Lydia Slem, I would say it's much more acute. It's really like she had this mm. treatment and she really wanted to get through it. And it was like she she was um, um, handicapped by the treatment and by the pain and the exhaustion and things like that. So it wasn't something, it was something she had to survive within that time period but if she got through it then she'd hopefully be better and world fairs not the quite the same because um it's the same in terms of breast cancer but with her depression in a sense we might want to think about that in a chronic way I don't know whether anyone disagrees with that but it is something that you have to cope with in a more long-term um sense um so that's a really interesting in interesting way to think about it um and from any perspectives yeah we might think about it, the fact that these women um, we'd have to do a little bit more research here to, to kind of make sure that I'm making a, a fair claim here, but they, they, they experienced their body previously as a space of freedom and strength and they had a lot of confidence in the body and its, and its capabilities and carrying through this, what carrying them through this world and being able to be a mode of expression. Um, and that was, um, radically challenged when they became sick. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it too in terms of um, what they're used to and what kind of bodily autonomy and freedom they're used to. Um, yeah, that, yeah, thanks for that. Great food for thought. Thank you, Ola. I think Judah has a question. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Dominique. Uh, thank you very much, first, for all three papers. I found they were really, really interesting, and I also really enjoyed um, Catherine's film. I wanted to say you could nearly smell <laughs> something because it is so really so touching. So thank you very much for that. But I actually have a small question for Caroline and for Beth um, concerning especially Lydia Flem, who I think, as far as I know, actually have been a photographer and also filmmaker before. She gave us for a volume on Flasher photos and that was in 2006. And as far as I know, she's quite a good friend also with Alain and they, I think, still work and at any rate have worked together at Le Frenois, the film studio in, in the north of France, which Alain Flasher directs. So my question is a small one, and I was interested in, in the composition of the pictures of the photos we saw, um, because they remind me of chess, of the play of chess. And so, because you talked rightly, I think, about cognitive fatigue, I was wondering if you had something to say about that symbolic of chess if you saw it as well, and actually it also appears in that film we talked about, well, I talked about, we talked about. So I was wondering, you know, about also the symbolic of, of the queen, but, but not only, and in relation to that um, need to, to control perhaps, maybe. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. So the, the funny thing about looking at those images, I, I absolutely did see that, the chessboard. Um, but I think there's a lot of different ways that we can read that. It's really interesting. And the first thing that I thought was um, her book, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Comment j'ai vidé la maison de mes parents, so how I emptied my parents' house. Oh, and I think it was the ones after that as well. She I actually can't remember which of the trilogy she says it in, but she talks about her parents and what she learns about their life. And she talks about how we're all allotted this role in life and we're all just like stepping around a... Um, uh, a chessboard. I can't remember the exact quote, but I couldn't help but look at these images within that context of like this is our lot, this is our place in life. We're allocated certain roles, and we just make our way around the board in the way that we're able to. It's kind of how I look at it, and I'm not sure how that. I, I didn't suggest that we talk about that here, um, just because I'm. I, I had struggled to find a um, 
a link um, with illness narratives. Um, but um, if I could just add one more thing before we continue, um, I don't have a copy of the book around me. I've got all these other books, but I don't have this one. Um, she also has another photographic series. Um, and this is one of them, and a keys in a kind of chessboard formation. So she has a whole series where she actually is, is only this idea of a chessboard. Um, yes, exactly. And I also, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I actually don't know where that leads us, but yeah, I, I think it's um, the symbolism there. We could we could look a lot further. Absolutely, I find that really interesting. Caroline, did you, did you have anything? Yeah, I just for me, uh, the whole um, series about the chess is also thinking about strategy, you know, the kind of strategy to cope with, with illness and her strategy was kind of taking pictures. So there was still, I think, this reflection of how am I going to process? How am I going to cope? How am I going to go through this? Uh, and I think the symbolism of the of the chess uh, board, um, you know, be, can be there as well. And obviously, with um, you know, La Reine, La Reine Alice being also one of the pieces uh, and moving in a certain way. So I, I think that there are actually many layers of, in, of of symbolism that one can actually decipher there. I think we mainly um, reflected on the kind of jumble as well with the words and try and really show how the the writing and the the picture taking. Um, even though they happen in two separate uh, instances, we're still very linked. You know, the, the, the photographic, um, the photos that were actually almost standing for what she could not do at the, at the time. So the fact that the, the chess uh, pattern also allows her to kind of interlink the writing uh, and the photography together uh, is also something else. So the, the strategy, uh, the 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 mingling almost of the writing and uh, and the pictures so yeah many 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 layers of symbolism for the chess uh, the chess board i think it's something we can definitely develop further in the analysis thank you thank you very much yeah that's interesting thank you mm -hmm. uh, so there's a comment in the chat going back to the the previous question uh, from elizabeth so thank you very much elizabeth for for, for sharing your experience um, i don't know if um, anyone want to um, say something about that comment or Elizabeth, if you want to come in? Um, or if there are other questions, we still have a few minutes left. For now, I don't see other questions or comments. So I, I do have uh, I do have one, uh, which um, which is for Regina initially, but of course um, other panelists might want to to say something about it. Particularly uh, Catherine, because you you did quote um, Laura, your marks in your in your film, and and the way you film the skin is is of course very. Uh, um, resonant of, of haptic visuality, uh, but Regina, in your in your talk, um, you you said uh, one way you 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 defined haptic image um, was to say that it makes um, traumatic um, experience visible, uh, and I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, the link um, or or the relation between um, haptic images as opposed to optic images with visibility. Um, she could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, that is super interesting because I, I mean, um, just this morning I actually thought about that sentence. I was like, yeah, that's it, it that's not the whole truth. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the haptic images may, or haptic, a, a haptic image, or the haptic image makes makes it visible. Yes, but it's it's more than that, right? And I think Laura Marx also talks about this. Well, the, she talks about the eye that can hear and the eye that can smell, and you know. So it kind of I find that so um, interesting. It's very confusing in a way, but also I think highly interesting to to think about. The, you see something, but that kind of you know evokes all these other senses in you. It was the same when I watched um, Catherine's film. Um, when I when I saw the the macro shot of the skin, it's almost like I could I could smell that skin of my grandma, for example, or um, I could I could I could literally feel it, you know, 
not even smell it's like this mixture of like smell and um touch you know of you know that is evoked by looking at this close-up shot of the skin um and i think that that's what i'm gathering at the moment from from the bit of research i've done with <laughs> laura marx and on my own uh, work uh that there, there is more to our visual sense than just seeing and yeah when you when you try and, and I, yeah it's i think maybe for my work it becomes even clearer when you see these images with the soundscape because the soundscape actually makes a big uh, makes up a big part of of the sensory experience um that the photos can't really do by themselves um yeah so yeah Thank you, Richard. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a part of Laura Marx which is kind of spectator theory, right? Mm -hmm. um, rather than creative <coughs> practice, practitioner experience. Because, and so I go to, I don't know if you guys know the McDougals, um, uh, visual ethnographers. Um, and um, David McDougall writes about how um, the, um, the film from the point of view of the filmmaker is almost the opposite as it is from the point of view of the viewer. Like it's just a fragment of the thing that they experienced. For the viewer, it is everything. So all of that has to happen, the skin, the smell, it all has to happen for the viewer. But for me, that's not enough, right? Because I'm actually there. So I'm actually connecting with the camera, actually connecting with the person. And then I'm actually connecting with the images when I'm cutting them together, um, but in not not in the same way. I don't think as the viewer. So I think there is a sense in which um, I'm trying to make that for someone else, but I need more um, when I'm I'm actually in the process of making it. Mm. It's also. Sorry, um, if we have time, I'll just come back yeah, to yeah, super brief thing. Um, I, I find it also interesting to think about um, how um, through this haptic spectatorship theory or this haptic image, you can, it's not only that you can, can communicate like a sensory experience, but actually I'm, I'm wondering if that is possible, if, if it's, you can actually communicate a form of knowledge, you know, that is in the body and mm -hmm. sits very deep and you can't express through words or through images alone maybe or through um whatever else um but that's through by, through looking at this image there is something that you know connects to you know your, yourself in in you um and it actually it's yeah you know something afterwards yeah that's i think i find quite thrilling and want to find out <laughs> Yeah, look, I agree. I think they're entirely different affordances between text and, and visuals. And it's why I, I still create films for these kinds of things, because it's how I communicate. Uh, and so to not use that, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's kind of this thing where... Um, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, I'll stop there. Um, I think I got it. I was just going to say, uh, perhaps yeah. Regina uh, and Catherine, you might have heard of it as well. Um, we, it would be interesting to read the work of Martine Benier. She works on French cinema, and she she uh, explores what you just said about uh, a different form of knowledge um, acquisition through uh, through haptic um, visuality. Amazing. Can you pop the name in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that now. Uh, Adina? Yeah, I, I have a little, I have desperate thoughts. Um, so I was wondering, Catherine, what was your uh, intention behind showing those close-ups of the skin? Because I've, I've worked on aging and, and haptic visuality, but I've never been able to um, ask someone so, so directly because um, this proximity is also, can be alienating. Um, but it can also reach into, into other um, senses and places outside of a narrative space. So I was wondering what your intentions behind that and the effect desired was. Yeah, um, that I can remember. Sorry, I couldn't remember the answer to Christine's question before. But um, uh, look, the intention really was to, um, to, to view the skin as landscapes. Uh, as vast, right? 
and 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 it's about um in a sense you know the women being vast also you know that they're they're you know whole landscapes full of person um and so what it wasn't really a kind of I wasn't trying to alienate or or those kinds of things. It was more really that connection with kind of um, the vastness of age um, than anything else. Yeah, it's funny because this reminds me of the there's a Josephine Decker movie called I think Bill was vast and lovely. So that's <laughs> that's a good tie-in. Yeah. So thank you very much for answering, Catherine. It's great. And thank you all. Well, that takes us to the uh, to the end of this uh, fantastic panel. So I want to congratulate again all of our speakers. Uh, please join me in a round of virtual applause uh, and the organ the organizers as well, because I think the, the panel works really worked really well together. So well done, uh, well done everyone, and thank you all for the uh, presentations and for the discussion. Uh, okay. Welcome everybody to the panel six, which is entitled Choices and the Inbetweenness of Vulnerability. Um, three speakers again, uh, so I'll introduce them one at a time and um, we'll uh, have discussion at the end after all three papers. Um, presume you can all hear me all right, yeah? Give me a thumbs up there, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, our first speaker, uh, in this panel is Laura Jane Devaney uh, from the University of Northampton. Um, Laura is senior lecturer in the education department at the University of Northampton, having earned her PhD uh, at De Montfort University in 2017 with a thesis entitled Speculative Fiction by 21st Century Women Writers. Uh, her research interest lies within contemporary feminisms and literary representations of the future female, with a particular focus on the female body as the locus of choice. She has recently published a review of Jeanette Winterson and Religion for the CWWA Journal, and currently has two book chapters awaiting publication. Later this year, The Possibilities and Pitfalls of the Literal Post-Human Atwood's Paradise Project and Revisioning Gendered Futures in Rivers Solomon's An Unkindness of Ghosts. And today, uh, Laura is talking to us about artificial intelligence, according to Jeanette Winterson. Over to you, Laura. Thank you for that, Douglas. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. So I'm just going to share my screen um, before I start and check that you can all see that. Um, so here we go. Um, so my paper today is entitled Radical and Regressive Artificial Intelligence According to Jeanette Winterson. Um, it's a reading of 12 bytes, how we got here, where we might go next, which was very recently published in 2021, alongside her previous novels, The Stone Gods from 2007 and Frankenstein in 2019. And in this paper, I wanted to address the theme of vulnerability in terms of technology. And the conference's calls, call for papers mentioned the contradictory nature um, of women's relations to technology and the contribution of AI towards female servitude, which immediately made me think of Jeanette Winterson's recent 12 Bytes publication and some of the essays I'd been reading in there in a section that was entitled, How Love, Sex and Attachment is Likely to Change as We Share Our Lives with AI. So I'll contemplate some of these essays alongside her speculative fiction novels, The Stone Gods and Frankenstein, to consider how Winston explores existing representations of gender whilst working to define new transhuman subjects. And a recurring theme throughout these novels is the way in which AI, despite its liberating and transcendent potential, is imagined as an inevitable perpetuation of female subjugation. So within the essay from 12 Bytes entitled My Bear Can Talk, Winterson describes the many types of relationships that humans can form with non-human and even non-biological entities. Um, in this chapter in particular, there's an emphasis on the immense potential of AI to assist with the formation of quite productive relationships. 
Winterson uses the COVID-19 crisis as a case in point in terms of the extreme isolation that was experienced by many or on the other end of the spectrum, some of the instances of enforced intimacy that others were forced to endure where homes became prisons and it tended to be women who, who bore the brunt of that. In this piece, she suggests that robot helpers in the house may have alleviated some of these circumstances. And she uses this to propose how in the future, having humanoid or even animaloid robot helpers can provide much needed support. For example, sending out SOS signals in abusive domestic situations um, or providing companionship to elderly people living alone. And essentially, um, the main theme of this chapter is that relationships matter to humans. And Winterson points out that one of the main arguments currently against be building meaningful relationships with AI is that humans are essentially embodied. But she does counter that this is a very strange pretext for objections, given that much of the important elements of our lives nowadays are not actually embodied at all. She also notes the capacity of humans to develop bonds with inanimate beings through talk. So think of talking to your childhood teddy bear, for example. And therefore, why shouldn't these bonds be extended towards machines? And she argues that eventually robots will expand our definition of what is aliveness and return to us what is a richer understanding of the interplay and interdependence between embodiment and non-embodiment. Robots will act as transitional objects for humans as we move towards pure AGI. Um, AGI being artificial general intelligence, where all the AI devices will communicate with each other. Um, it may be that humans need transitional objects because our bodies are in themselves transitional objects. So an exemplification of this expanded definition of aliveness is depicted in her earlier no 2007 novel, The Stone Gods. The novel explores what being human means through examining the tenuous boundaries that are used to separate humans from other forms of conscious life. Winston uses the figure of the robo sapiens to question notions of identity and what it means to be human. The robo sapiens in the novel are originally presented to the reader as AI robots that simply look and act human, only machines who are nothing but silicon and a circuit board, incapable of feeling emotion because emotions are not part of their programming. However, the name Robo Sapiens does merge the concept of Roman and robot and human as a hybrid form. And as the novel progresses, it becomes clear that the Robo Sapiens are evolving beyond their originally defined limits and they work to destabilize the boundaries between human and machine. In the novel, this is particularly illustrated through a developing relationship between the novel's narrator, Billy Crusoe, and a Robo Sapiens named Spike. Winterson uses the relationship between Billy and Spike to set up substantial debate throughout the novel, in doing so posing difficult questions about the nature of humanity. Um, for example, Billy states I've, about Spike, I forget all the time that she's a robot, but what's a robot? A moving lump of metal. In this case, an intelligent, ultra-sensitive moving lump of metal. What's a human? A moving lump of flesh, in most cases not intelligent or remotely sensitive. In turn, Spike asks to Billy, is human life biology or consciousness? If I were to lop off your arms, your legs, your ears, your nose, put out your eyes, roll up your tongue, would you still be you? You locate yourself in consciousness and I too am a conscious being. So through these debates, the binaries of human, machine, material, informational, technology, biology, biology all come under scrutiny. And Billy, and therefore in turn the reader, is made to consider how such binary systems have shaped our own understanding of what it means to be human. So the robo sapiens spike and the debates that she provokes surrounding corporeal and consciousness rework and expand the idea of the human subject to prove a post-human proposition that ultimately there is no definitive human subject. And this in turn opens up possibilities for reconfiguring conceptions of AI entities as well as for humans. The fact that Spike's identity is shifting um, and in constant play 
seen as a process rather than a static entity draws attention to the way in which both human and machine are socially constructed. Spike's physical form um, combined with sophisticated artificial intelligence in some ways does demonstrate a transcendent potential for AI technology in, in quite a liberating fashion. However, in this novel, gender is the one social construct that the robo sapiens fail to transcend. Spike defines gender as a human concept. Um, the implication of this being that the potential for truly transcending gender lies with non-human entities. But there is a clear reproduction of gendered stereotypes and a perpetuation of regressive gendered structures that is exposed through Winterson's very cutting use of satire. Um, Spike is described variously as incredibly sexy, beautiful, drop dead gorgeous, perfect, and she's been created to embody conventional ideas of gendered feminine beauty. And when the reader learns that Spike used up three silicon lined vaginas in providing sexual service to the male astronauts during a space mission, it's clear that she's also been created to conform to quite oppressive, re regressive gender roles. So Billy says to Spike, Spike, you're a robot, but why are you such a drop dead gorgeous robot? I mean, is it necessary to be the most sophisticated machine ever built and to look like a movie star? She answers simply, they thought I would be good for the boys on the mission. But you were also the most advanced member of the crew. I'm still a woman. So Spike's sexual subjugation is inextricably linked with her gendered status as a woman, which reveals the limitations of technology, or at the very least, the limitations of those who are in control of this technology um, to reimagine experience for the gendered subject. And therefore, Spike fails to realise the more radical potential of non-human AI entities to embody a more utopian um, ideal of post-gender existence. And furthermore, although Billy is angered by the sexual exploitation of Spike, she does fail to fully empathise at this point in the novel because to her, Spike is still categorised as robot rather than human, and thereby it reinforces this intrinsic link between humanity and constructs of gender. Billy says, I want to be outraged um, on this woman's behalf, but she isn't a woman, she's a robot. And isn't it better that they used a robot instead of dispatching a couple of sex slaves? So such a conflicting statement that's present in Billy's question here leads on to some of the issues that are explored within another of the essays from the 12 Bytes collection, which is entitled Hot for a Bot. And in this chapter, Winterson examines a growing trend for AI-enabled sex robots. Um, the sex doll market is growing fast, with AI-enabled love dolls projected to be a multi-billion earner industry within the next few years. And indeed, in, in a novel that I'll discuss later, Frankenstein, this is uh, Frankenstein, this is the premise behind um, the character Ron Lord and his idea for a franchise. And he's appeared to he appears to be based on the real life figure um, of Matt McMullen and his real botics creation, which, uh, creations, excuse me, um, which Winston also discusses in this same essay. Winston points out that sex dolls in themselves are nothing new, but what's new with sex dolls is the makeover, the rebrand. AI enhanced love dolls are being marketed as alternatives alternatives to sex workers, alternatives to a relationship with a woman, alternatives to women. And what is also new is the age or the coming age of the digisexual, people who form sexual relationships with digital entities. So within this essay, Winston questions how men who own, and as she says, note the verb here, a sex robot, will be affected by their interactions with such a compliant entity. And she draws on the damaging effects that have been seen in contemporary society of porn on shaping young people's expectations of sex as an example. A love doll can't say no. With a sex bot, a man can always be sure of the outcome because it will be the outcome he wants. That is dangerous. For too many men, judging from the data, a compliant man-made female is preferable to a woman with a mind and a body of her own. Now, Winterson does acknowledge the potential positives of AI-enabled sex robots, so a safer sex industry compared to some of the risks that are currently associated with sex work, um, 
a solution to the constraints of monogamy, the prevention of otherwise happy relationships falling apart simply because of a lack of sex. However, she outlines that the three main problems that constitute the substrate of the sex doll industry, and these are money, power and gender roles. She argues that the money and the power remain with men um, and the, sex, uh, the gender roles are created and unrealistic. Winston is a self-confessed enthusiast for AI, but the enthusiasm is definitely lacking within this particular chapter um, as she arrives at the conclusion that AI-enabled sex bots are not so much about new technology as it is about backward-looking sexism and gender stereotyping. And this is the more pessimistic future that's presented to the reader in her 2019 novel, Frankenstein which goes backwards and forwards in the form of a dual narrative between Mary Shelley during the time of her conception of the story of Frankenstein and a day after tomorrow future where a Dr. Rye Shelley is considering how robots will affect our, our mental and physical health. Rye is attending a global tech expo on robotics to interview Ron Lord, who was the previously mentioned founder of the sex doll franchise. And Ron talks Rye through the ins and outs, quite literally, of the creation of the sex bots from their production through to marketing. And through Ron's narrative voice, Winterson provides a powerfully satirical magnification of an objectification and commercialization of women's bodies, particularly through his reductive description of how the sex bots are created and the female form is separated down to its individual body parts torso comes through first swinging on the overhead wires lovely slim arms then the legs look at the length the shape slightly longer than they would be if she was human this is fantasy not nature <clears throat> so you can have what you want lightweight too makes a man feel strong Although the unrealistic nature of this fantasy version of the female form is explicitly acknowledged by Ron as he says what we offer is fantasy life not real life what is particularly disturbing is the way in which he anthropomorphizes the sex bots through the use of pronouns, um, bring her in for a service once or twice a year, depending on wear and tear. Online, you can order spare parts if any of her gets damaged or too messy. Renting is popular with stag weekends, get half a dozen of the girls in for fun, fun and frolics. Using she, her and the noun girls when referring to the sex bots has the objectifying effect of aligning women with a mode of commodification. The novel draws attention to the deliberation created by AI enhanced robots regarding the boundaries of what is seen as human as well as the nature of human consciousness. But this is not a fictional debate. So in 2017, the social robot Sophia, who you can see in the, um, the bottom left picture, was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia. So given actual legal personhood status and also think of the need for the Turing test, which has been designed to determine whether a machine can demonstrate human intelligence, essentially whether a machine can pass for human. That's in the bottom right figure. Um, no computer has passed this test yet, but some suggest that AI will be able to pass this test by the year 2030. If in the near future AI does pass this threshold and we enter into a transhuman era, then what are the implications for women in particular? <clears throat> This novel raises worrying questions um, through the objectification and treatment of sex bots and the vision of the future is created by someone like Ron, um, a world where women are seen as malleable and disposable. So as Ron says, we also offer trade-ins and upgrades um, where female companionship is viewed in terms of unrealistic body ideals and compliancy. All these beautiful girls, girls who would never get old or ill, girls who would always be saying yes and never saying no. What are the implications for female body image, for example, or for the issue of consent? A more optimistic view of AI within Franken Frankenstein is put forward through the character Professor Victor Stein, who argues that there are no sides, that binaries belong to our carbon-based past, the future is not biology, it's AI. And Victor proposes a world of AI whereby the physical limits of our bodies become irrelevant as intelligence and perhaps even consciousness is no longer dependent on a 
body. And during one of his presentations, when asked by an audience member, will women be the first casualties of obsolescence in your brave new world? Victor Stein posits that AI need not replicate outmoded gender prejudices. The world I imagine, the world that AI will make possible will not be a world of labels. And that includes binaries like male and female, black and white, rich and poor. So Victor's philosophy here brings us nicely to the final essay from 12 Bytes to be drawn upon in this paper, um, entitled Fuck the Binary. Here, Winterson summarises the essential problem with any form of AI as the way our own human bias skews a tool that is essentially neutral. AI isn't that door to freedom because AI is trained on data sets. What's in the data set is what the AI learns. The open door closes pretty fast. And more and more research is being done these days on the echo chamber effect of AI and its algorithms and how these can actually accentuate and heighten the initial gaps and errors that already exist. So think about the 2020 docudrama film Social Dilemma and the expose that that gave on algorithms in social networking. If, as Winston posits, humans are still enthralled to the idea of gender essentialism, then the concern is that existing bias will only become reinforced and amplified through the interventions with AI. So, Ending on a slightly more optimistic note in this essay, Winterson returns to the use of a trope that permeates much of her oeuvre, and that is the importance of narrative and storytelling in shaping human experience. She argues that humans are not nature nurture, humans are narrative. And if this is true, then the overriding narrative does have the potential to change, and see, she sees technology and AI as part of that changing story. Um, AI at present is a tool. How we use our tools depends on the dominant narrative. Breaking the binary as the dominant narrative is an urgent business. This radical potential does, though, come with a stark warning of the accompanying regressive pitfalls. Unless we can change the fixed ideas in our heads, then tech and AI could easily become the dystopian disaster so many of us fear. Um, so that is my presentation on Winterson, but I just thought I'd include a final slide on some of the related theory that kind of helped work to inform and interpret some of the texts. Um, so Bradotti's concept of the um, post-human, Haraway's concept of the cyborg, um, and also her her recent publication, Staying with the Trouble, um, along with N. Catherine Hales on the post-human and Cheryl Vint with her embodied post-humanism as well. So it is my great pleasure um, and honor to be introducing Catherine Robson, who is a senior lecturer in French here at Newcastle University and author of I Suffer, Therefore I Am, Engaging with Empathy in Contemporary French Women's Life Writing and Writing Wounds the Inscription of Trauma in Post-1968 French Women's Life Writing, as well as articles and book chapters on trauma, sexual abuse, loss and empathy. She is currently working on a book about cultural representations of happiness in contemporary French women's writing, because um, alas, there is some happiness even in contemporary French women's writing and film. Um, Catherine has had a really great influence on, on my work um, throughout my PhD and onwards. And I'm really happy that she is my mentor here at Newcastle. So her talk today is entitled Faces of Vulnerability, Masking and Misrecognition in Contemporary French Women's Writing. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Adina. And, and thank you, Sandra, too. So thank you for that lovely introduction that kind of over-introduced me. <laughs> anyway, very nice. And thank you to both of you for asking me to come and speak and be part of the conference. I really enjoyed it. Um, there's such a diverse range of papers and so many things to think about. And my Amazon list has got longer <laughs> and longer. So I'm in danger there, but anyway. So I'm aware I've got quite a long time to speak on Zoom. Don't worry, I'm not going to speak for the full length of time. That would kill everybody off and it would kill my throat off. Um, if your concentration is anything like mine, although I've realised maybe everybody else's isn't, I've sort of understood that everyone else has this amazing capacity to concentrate and I haven't. So if you're anything like me, I'm trying to break the points up a lot. OK, so hopefully you can follow me. Um, but if my tech fails, which might happen, or anything is, isn't clear, just interrupt and let me know. But don't put it in the chat because I won't see it. I, I seem to be oblivious to chat when I'm talking. So just, just unmute and, and button, that's fine. OK, so I'm just going to share my screen. I can. It looks like it's working. 
Can everyone see that? Yeah, good. Okay. So, <clears throat> according to Lauren Balland, recognition is more accurately a bearable form of misrecognition. So they say recognition is the misrecognition you can bear. And this paper is going to explore misrecognition through faces and masks of vulnerability in contemporary French women's writing, or I suppose explore vulnerability in and through the notion of misrecognition. I'm going to begin by going through Balance ideas on misrecognition, and then I'll move on to discuss the French novels. But before I go on, um, there's an image of one of the three novels in translation on the slide, which actually you saw yesterday in Nutter's paper, um, and she was talking about the same text. So it's the novel Who You Think I Am, Zed Kuvu Um, The reason I want to start with that image um, is that Essentially, the woman is facing away from the camera, which I think you just said yesterday, and holding a mask above her head. And I think it highlights certain points that are useful um, coming into looking at what uh, Balance says about recognition, misrecognition, etc. So what this cover highlights for me is that you can't look through the mask and see her face. So normally we look at masks and we try to see through them to see what lies beneath. But actually, this cover foregrounds the fact that we can't. Um, in a sense, what this cover does is detach the mask from the face completely. That's the first point. And the second point is that underneath the mask, there's a blank, there's absolutely nothing to see. The other thing I wanted to say is that she's actually holding the mask herself. So she's holding it above her head. But you get the impression that she's in control of what we see and what we don't see. And I see a challenge there too. So the title, the challenge is in the title, Who You Think I Am, Said Kubu Kwayi. It's a challenge to the reader, basically, who do you think I am? Can we know who she is? Can we recognize her? But also, as I'm going to show, it kind of forces us to acknowledge our own misrecognition. Because who you think I am is very obviously not going to be who I am. So the cover in itself poses the issue of, of misrecognition. So before I go any further, I just want to um, say a little bit more about Berlant's point in the context of speaking on Zoom. Obviously, we've been on Zoom for two days. And um, so in 2020, 2021, like everybody else, I was teaching students on Zoom. Uh, well, unlike the unlucky people who are on Teams, which is even worse, but anyway, I was on Zoom. And then, I did, this may just happen to me, but when I met them in real life, sometimes I didn't actually recognize them. So we came back on campus, and the students turned up and I taught them all the year before and I somehow didn't know who they were. Um, partly it's me because I'm hopeless at faces. Partly it's because they were wearing masks and I was wearing a mask and obviously that makes it harder again. But partly it's because the image we see of somebody on Zoom, so like the classic um, head and shoulder view, is, is very different from the image we see in person in a different context. Um, this probably is just me, but I always imagined everybody taller than they turned out to be <laughs> when they appeared on campus. And I was kind of hoping that everyone thought I was taller than I really am as well, but that might not have happened. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that in some ways, as we went back onto campus in 2021, it was actually harder to recognize people in person than it had been on Zoom because of the masks, because we were keeping a distance from each other. Um, Maybe because Zoom has the name next to the face, that makes life easier for everybody, whatever. So a few things there. It struck me that first of all, it seemed easier to recognize students online than it did on campus. But I did also realize that my Zoom-based recognitions were also misrecognitions. So I realized that I'd made all sorts of assumptions about students based on how they looked and behaved on the little Zoom box on my screen. So then when I met them in person, they often turned out to be completely different. So some of these students, when you put them in automatic or automated Zoom rooms, they're very vocal, they participate a lot, they seem really confident and sociable. And then once they're back in the classroom, they really struggle to form easy attachments, they sat slightly apart from others, they seemed awkward, they were quieter. And of course, the reverse was also true. The very quiet people on Zoom sometimes became um, much more vocal and participated better uh, in person. 
So the point here is that it wasn't that they were masked on campus and unmasked on Zoom, although they were literally in some ways, or that they were masked on Zoom and somehow unmasked on campus. The point is that I was misrecognizing them in both contexts. So when we recognize, we also misrecognize. And getting rid of the screen or removing the mask, and in some ways those things are seen as synonymous in a couple of the, the novels I'm looking at, that doesn't necessarily help us to recognize better, although we imagine that it will. And that's part of the fantasy of recognition that we imagine that we can recognize better at any point. Hopefully the slide has moved on. So the structure of the paper, I'm just gonna go through briefly what I'm going to do. So firstly, I'm gonna outline the theoretical concepts that underpin the discussion. And then I'm going to go on to discuss three relatively recent French novels, so all published in the last 10 years, and, and the most recent one published last year, in fact, in 2021. So these are the three novels that will form the basis of my discussion. I'm not going to say much about them yet, but I do want to briefly introduce them just in terms of their vulnerable subjects. OK, I'm trying to focus on vulnerability here, so I've, I'm not going to go into all the other fascinating aspects of the three texts. So the first one is Yasmina Reza, so happy are the happy. Um, the most vulnerable character here is arguably a boy called Jacob, who's lost sight of who he really is. So he believes he's Celine Dion, and he thinks he's in a recording studio, um, when actually he's in his late teens, it's a boy, and he's in a mental health institution. So he thinks the nurses are his fans, he thinks his parents are his fans, etc. So he's the principal vulnerable character in this novel, but actually the novel shows all of the characters to be vulnerable in different ways as well. So the second text, um, which I've already mentioned, Camille Lawrence's uh, Who You Think I Am, Celle Que Vous Croyez. Um, I've just given you a different cover here. I promise I'm not gonna spend the whole paper talking about covers. In fact, I very rarely talk about covers, but it's just they seem germane here. This is one of the French covers and you've got um, a pixelated and a kind of partially visible female face. So the mouth's wide open in what looks like a scream and you've got bright red lipstick, which is the most striking thing probably about the image. So this novel, as you heard yesterday from Yuta, features a middle-aged woman trying to find love and recognition on the internet. So she's trying to be seen and that's um, encapsulated in the red lipstick on the cover and heard, hence the image of the screen, but she finds herself invisible and inaudible in a misogynistic ageist culture where women lose visibility as they age. So the vulnerable subject here is an educated middle-aged woman struggling with her position as a woman growing older in a patriarchal society. And finally, Delphine de Vigan, uh, Les Enfants Sans Roi, The Children Are Kings, or children are kings. So this one is about children forced by a mother who's very narcissistic to become YouTube stars. So she turns them into YouTube stars by filming them constantly and posting the videos on YouTube on the channel she creates. One of the children ends up kidnapped and both of the children end up very emotionally disturbed. So while they're the primarily vulnerable subjects in the text, I would say that the mother is also vulnerable having spent years watching Loft Story with her family as a teenager. And then she had a difficult time being exploited on a reality TV show herself. So three slightly different images of vulnerability here. I could have chosen a number of texts because faces of vulnerability are very common in contemporary French women's writing and probably not just French women's writing, in women's writing in general. So you, you get in French, in recent writing in French, we see bereaved mothers, infanticidal mothers, characters with eating disorders, politically disempowered characters. And we see, oh, sorry, flipped screen. We see many spaces of vulnerability as well. So hospitals, mental health clinics, also the family home and the workplace are also spaces of vulnerability for uh, the characters in, in contemporary French women's writing. So I've chosen these three novels because they tackle the question of recognition in relation to vulnerability. But I want to add two points here. So the first one is that the subjects in this paper are not only vulnerable, okay? In some ways, they're very privileged as well. And I think that's worth bearing in mind. <clears throat> so it doesn't mean dismissing their vulnerability. 
but it does mean contextualizing it to some extent. Um, and the second point, which is related, I suppose, is that all the subjects I look at here are vulnerable in very different ways. And this is also crucial. So vulnerability is enacted quite differently in each subject and in each text. Right. So the theory. Um, I'm looking at Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism. And that's kind of main focus of the theory in the paper, although there are some other texts as well. I've given you the cover. As I said, I promise I'm not obsessed with covers, but because the cover also is quite useful here. So if you can see on the cover, there's a painting um, entitled If Body, Riva and Zora in Middle Age, and it's by Riva Lara. So it's an image of a Riva with her dog. So you can see a dog who's blind in one eye and has a cone. Actually, I'm not sure if, the right, if that's the right word, sorry, but has a kind of cone-like thing around her, her head to protect her face. The dog's brushing very closely against Reva, and Reva's lying on the floor, and she's got her hands covering her face. So this is an image of two vulnerable subjects, neither of whom can see clearly. One because of partial blindness and one because she has her hands covering her face. But it's also an image of intimacy and an image of solidarity. So the dog seems to be looking up almost on behalf of Reva, if you like. And Reva seems to be touching her face as if in support of Zora, who, who can't touch her wounded face, thanks to the thing, the name of which escapes me, <laughs> that's around her head. So according to Berlant, the neoliberal capitalist present is defined by vulnerability. So Berlant refers to subjects existing in what they call systemic crisis or crisis ordinariness, wherein crisis is not exceptional, but a process embedded in the ordinary that unfolds in stories about navigating what's overwhelming. Okay, if anyone hasn't come across Berlant before, it's always incredibly dense, so it needs a little bit of unpacking. Um, what I want to show here really is that crisis ordinariness should be understood or, or can be understood as an alternative form of trauma. So it's not a singular breach in an otherwise relatively smooth existence. What Balant's talking about is subjects living in a perpetual state of trauma. So a perpetual state of crisis. These are subjects struggling just to keep going. In other words, these are subjects who aren't living a stable life, which is punctuated by a one-off or even by episodic trauma. Their whole existence is shaped in and out of crisis. So Balant's portraying subjects, vulnerable subjects, trapped in crisis ordinariness, dog paddling, and that's Balant's term, not mine, just to stay afloat. So these subjects are unable to access the good life promised by neoliberal cultural discourse. And again, the good life is Balant's term, not my term. So Balant says, the promise of the good life no longer masks the living precarity of this historical present. This is evidenced in the emergence of a new mask, a precarious visage, a recession grimace. I'll unpack that quote in a minute, but just to note the good life, because if you're like me, then sort of alarm bells go off at the sound of a term like the good life. What Belant means here in this formulation is a life socially and politically defined as a good life. And obviously this is caught up in neoliberal ideas and neoliberal values. So it's about particular types of life that are approved and sanctioned in society. The good life is a promise to all citizens, equal access in neoliberal culture, Obviously, that doesn't, it doesn't work out like that, but that is the promise. And it's that promise that makes subjects behave in certain ways and make particular choices in the hope of reaching that promised good life. But in recent years, Berlant argues, for many vulnerable subjects, the promise is no longer enough and choices are made out of necessity. In other words, choices are non-choices made out of complete necessity just to keep going in the moment. So Balance talking about subjects who are making choices based in desperation, um, who are dog paddling just to stay afloat. They're not in a position to choose which direction to go in. They simply have to do what they can to stay alive, essentially. I am interested in the language that Balant uses here. So the new mask, the precarious visage and the grimace. 
In this sentence, though, the mask and the face somehow become interchangeable. So the mask and the visage, there's no, there's no separation from between each other in the sentence, rather than one covering the other. So you'd usually expect one to cover the other, and that's not what happens here. Both are precarious, rooted in instability, an instability that's political, social, individual, and that's hinted at the notion of the recession grimace. So I want to take seriously the implication here that vulnerability emerges in and through masking rather than through the removal of the mask. So the idea that the vulnerable face can precisely be seen despite or perhaps thanks, thanks to its mask. So in this paper, I'm going to explore masked faces of vulnerability, but I want to take the mask as being as important as the face that it would appear to cover. Right, now onto the misrecognition part of the theory. The second key point that I'm taking from Berlant is the, the kind of from the quotation I started with. So where we imagine we're recognizing, we are in fact misrecognizing, not because we're seeing the mask rather than the face, but because even when we see the face or think we see the face, we misrecognize. So what is misrecognition? So Berlant says that misrecognition, méconnaissance, describes a psychic process by which fantasy recalibrates what we encounter so that we can imagine that something or someone can fulfill our desire. To misrecognize is not to err, but to project qualities onto something so that we can love, hate, and manipulate it for having those qualities, which it might or might not have. So it is through misrecognition that subjects all subjects, if you follow Berlant, navigate relations with others and with the world around. So misrecognition is a way of making sense of others and also of ourselves. Berlant actually highlights that we don't just misrecognize others, we also misrecognize ourselves. And what we think of as recognition for Berlant is more accurately a misrecognition. When we think we've nailed it, it's because it's a misrecognition which fulfills some sort of desire, possibly a desire that we don't even know that we have. So where we think that we're recognizing, we're actually fantasizing that recognition. Um, so th there's nothing different about recognition and misrecognition, except that the one fulfills a fantasy that the other one doesn't, or appears to fulfill a fantasy, I suppose. How does this relate to vulnerability? It's because the fantasy of misrecognition for many vulnerable subjects lays bare what Berlant calls the intensity of the need to feel normal. So not just the intensity of the need to feel normal, but to be recognized as such. So Berlant refers to feeling normal and to having a life in the same context. And in this context, having a life, their expression, is almost a shorthand for being recognized as a socially approved subject. So the desire to feel normal, to feel as though they have a life, makes subjects misrecognize not just other people or themselves and their place in the world, but the possibility of a good life. So the desire not just to have a life or a good life, but to be seen to have a life, and that's part of it. It's not just about feeling you have a life, but having other people acknowledge you as someone who lives a life. This desire drives particular choices about how to live, firstly, and secondly, about how to show other people how you live. And these two things are obviously not necessarily synonymous, but they, they do to some extent overlap. For many vulnerable individuals in neoliberalism then, the de desperation to have a life and to be seen to have a life can make them make damaging choices. And Balan explains this in relation to the notion of cruel optimism, which is obviously the title of the book. So they say that whilst on one level, they know they are mired in an interminable present, they also end up with cruel optimism. So basically these subjects cling to the promises of a better life, but these promises actually make their present situation worse. So one example Berlant gives there is of subjects utterly worn down or worn out by the systemic crisis of daily life in poverty with no prospects of economic or social improvement, who end up overeating to help themselves feel better 
become addicted to the short-term um, satisfaction of junk food, make themselves ill and then and then less physically capable of life as a result. That's just one example. But what Balanced showing is these people are not in a position to make decisions about their lives that other people would deem to be um, sensible or, or would lead to successful outcomes. They're simply not in those positions. So misrecognition here applies not just to people, but to life choices. But obviously I'm saying choices, but in a sense, those choices are already overdetermined because the people dog paddling in precarity can only ever make choices that help them survive in the here and now, that there is no other possibility, according to Boland. The image on the right side of the slide is Claire Pentecost's appetite sovereignty, um, which is reproduced in Cruel Optimism. Um, I know it's quite hard to see, um, and I am not an art critic, and you'll probably be able to tell, um, but hopefully you can see the photograph of the torso sticking out of a sort of cartoon-like sketch of a headless person. So the sketched um, body shape figures lots of upside down faces, which contrasts as those are faces drawn on the body, but there's no head in, in evidence. So usually faces imply recognition. Okay, a face is a shorthand for recognition, but I think, uh, as I say, I'm not an art critic, and it's just my interpretation of the image, it's not balance. I think this image foregrounds the impossibility of recognition and of seeing three faces to some sort of presupposed real identity underneath. So to sum up, for Berlant, vulnerability is rooted in firstly, the need for recognition, and secondly, the underlying inevitable misrecognition, which can be damaging in, in different ways for different subjects. So the three novels I'm going to look at today all give voice to vulnerability in and through a poetics of misrecognition. And this poetics is figured in terms of masking and unmasking and in the trope of unboxing, a YouTube phenomenon, which you may know if you have children who are interested in this stuff or if you're <laughs> more internet friendly than me. Um, so I'm gonna begin with Happy Other Happy um, because this text deals head on with the relation between masking, unmasking and vulnerability. Um, this text also takes place entirely offline I'm then going to move on to the other two novels, which both stage vulnerability in terms of social media and, and the internet. So, happy are the happy. So, Yasmina Reza's Heureux les Heureux is a series of portraits of 18 unhappy individuals. So, it's called Happy are the Happy, but everybody's really unhappy in the text. And they're all connected to each other in some way. So they, you get one narrator and later you get another narrator who turns out to be married to the first one or the doctor of another one or a sibling or whatever. And um, the title is taken from Borges, um, which is also the epigraph to the book. So an extended form of it is the epigraph. And I'll read, I'm gonna read all the quotes in English. I've given you them all in French as well. Obviously this one's in Spanish, um, but I'll just read everything in English, but the French is there for anyone who, who can, follow it. So here Borges says, happy are the loved and the lovers and those who can do without love. Happy are the happy. So Borges seems to be suggesting that happiness is both independent of relationships with others. So you can be happy if you don't need love. Um, but it is also still defined first in terms of relationships, in the sense that those who can do without love are still being defined in relation to love, if that makes sense even though they can do without it, somehow it still figures in the equation. Right, so in Reza's novel, everyone's connected to somebody else, as I already said, but nobody except one character is happy. Just to add, the word heureux in French also carries the connotation of luck, um, as does happy in English, in fact. And Reza points out that heureux also means lucky. Lucky are the happy. Um, presumably, you could also formulate it as happy are the lucky, and I would say that in balance theory, the lucky, the ones with more economic and social privilege, are clearly more likely to have opportunities to be happy. In this novel, though, as I said, nobody except the one character is happy, and absolutely everybody is trapped in structures of misrecognition, as we're going to see. Right, so... This text clearly illustrates Balant's argument about love in a different text, Desire Love. So Balant states, 
The fantasy, which is at the heart both of popular culture and Lacanian psychoanalysis, is that love is the misrecognition you like, can bear, and will keep try to keep consenting to. If the other will accept your fantasy realism as the condition of their encounter with their own lovability, and if you will agree to accept theirs, the couple, and it could be any relation, not just a, a sexual relation, has a fighting chance not to be destroyed by the aggressive presence of ambivalence with its jumble of memory, aggressive projection, and blind experimentation. This is not a cynical bargain, but the bargain that fantasy enables for any subject to take up a position in a sustained relation. Okay, I did, <laughs> I did warn you that it was dense. So the idea that's expressed in cruel optimism that misrecognition, sorry, that recognition is the misrecognition you can bear is rooted in this statement in Desire Love that love is the misrecognition you can bear. But what's interesting here is that in the earlier formulation, there's more emphasis on reciprocity if you note. So both the self and the other have to collude in the fantasy. So Balance says, if the other will accept your fantasy as the condition of their encounter with their own lovability, and if you will agree to accept theirs. So I suppose what Balance, the implication of this is that love is, is, it works in a similar way, but it requires this sort of reciprocal fantasy, if you like. The love reference here, as I said, is not necessarily sexual. In a way, what Balance describing is broader, covering any sort of relation or attachment. And this is what we can see in Rosa's novel, which takes the 18 unhappy people and narrates them from a variety of viewpoints. The effect of this is that we see both how they seek to present themselves and to others and to the reader, but also how other people see them. You could argue that we see the masks they put on but we also see some unmasking, perhaps. So I would argue that characters in this novel do see love as the misrecognition you can bear. And what happens is they cling to this with absolutely fixed cruel optimism, even when they can almost see how dysfunctional their own relationships are. So they keep going with really destructive attachments while trying to fantasize that these attachments are really positive and constructive. They're also damaged though, through what Berlant refers to as aggressive projection and the breakdown of fantasy. So the fantasy can't be sustained in the novel. So just a few examples of how the relationships work. Basically, they're all mediated through conflict, disagreement, even violence. Giving you some examples, so Robert and Odile in the first chapter, it starts with them arguing in the supermarket because he picked up Morbier instead of Gruyère and his, his wife's cross. So it ends up with him swearing and becoming brutal, um, not savage, I think is the English. Um, yeah, so he, he ends up almost violent. Um, second example is, is a woman called Paula who's having an affair and she gets overcome with melancholia in a restaurant. So she goes to a restaurant with her lover, Luke, who's, who's married. Um, and it's supposed to be a sort of romantic encounter, but she describes herself as miserable uh, in a so-called intimate booth. So she's very aware of her own loneliness in that relationship, but she clings to it anyway. So it's a classic example of cruel optimism. She will not break that attachment because even a poor attachment is better than no attachment. Third example, Rémy is in a restaurant with his lover and he says he's eating lacklustre soup in a dreary, half-empty restaurant. And then he says, she was almost bored and then I was almost bored too. Again, they're more attached to the attachment itself, so cruel optimism, than they are to each other. Um, by the way, some of the, the emptiness in this novel really reminds me of what Marnie was talking about yesterday and the sort of flattening out of emotion that's very clear in this text as well, although it's not dealing with, with teenagers. The second point I want to make, though, is that their attachments are based on lies and masks that are intended to protect their own vulnerability, but end up exposing their own vulnerability and reinforce, reinforcing other people's vulnerability as well. So here's an example. Um, this is the Hutner family. Um, so Pas Pascaline and Lionel, who both recount chapters in the novel, they're seen as the perfect family and they make other people jealous, they think. So she says people often react aggressively to the happiness of others. So she thinks they're jealous because they have a close-knit successful unit. 
But the assumption that they're happy is based on lies about their family life and particularly about their son, Jacob. So Jacob has been sectioned to a mental health clinic, as I said before, he's convinced he's Celine Dion. But his parents pretend to everybody except the family cleaner, Bogdana, that he's on an internship abroad. And we assume that they don't see Bogdana as a social equal, so she doesn't count or she isn't recognised as one of the people that they perform to impress. Now, Jacob, however, is the happiest character in the novel, and he's, he's the only happy character in the novel, as I said. Believing the mental health clinic is a recording studio, he thinks his parents are his fans, he thinks the staff are other performers in the show or his fans, it, it varies. So happiness is associated with fantasy, with a strategic refusal of reality that is necessarily short-lived. You could say happy are the happy as long as they can ward off any awareness of reality. And it's interesting that the text does tell us that even Jacob is unhappy when he watches the news. So in the case of Jacob, happiness means failing to recognize other people's vulnerability. So at one point he notices his parents' unhappiness and he says to them, you don't look very happy right now, Lionel and Pascaline but he doesn't recognize his own part in it. So the fact that he, he doesn't address them as his parents, he doesn't recognize them as his parents, he just thinks they're his fans. Note he doesn't um, call, he calls them by their first names. In other words, he recognizes they're unhappy, but he doesn't recognize them as individuals and he doesn't respond to their sadness. So they want to talk to him as their son, but he tries to cheer them up by singing as if he was Celine Dion. And he says, I I'm gonna to sing to you to help lift their spirits, even though they ask him not to sing and they just want him to be Jacob, but he can't. Now, as he sings, his parents hear the staff laughing at him in the um, neighboring room. And his dad ends up confronting the staff with the assertion that I am the father of Jacob Rutner. Now, this assertion reiterates Lionel's own identity and connection with the son who denies him. And of course, it also gives him authority through the name of the father, but it also forces the staff to recognize Jacob himself with his full name. Now, this recognition is of course also a misrecognition given that Jacob is convinced he's Celine Dion, not Jacob. And it's not a misrecognition that Jacob can bear. And this is the problem in this text. There is no recognition even in the form of a bearable misrecognition. Jacob, who fantasizes his own bearable misrecognition while tuning out everybody else's misrecognitions, is the only character who could be seen to be happy, but this is only because he refuses to acknowledge other people's misrecognitions and because he imposes his own misrecognitions on others. And of course, he's also uh, confined to the clinic, shut off from the outside world. Now, after, Lionel announces that he's Jacob's father. He goes to a Russian bar with his wife to drink vodka and they sit discussing which clinic employee Jacob means when he talks about Barbara Streisand, he talks about singing with Barbara Streisand. It's almost as though they've begun to collude in his delusion as a way of keeping going. Um, so the recourse to alcohol obviously suggests an attempt to ward off reality and to share a reciprocal fantasy. You could say they've begun to collude in the misrecognition and take that back to the, the quote I gave earlier from Berlant about the, the, the reciprocal fantasy or the reciprocal misrecognition. Then when, Jake, when Lionel tells his friends about the son Celine Dion fixation, he finally tells them the truth. All of them struggle not to laugh, but it's really interesting how they describe this. So they struggle to wear what his friend refers to as the painful mask that Lionel needs. In other words, in this novel, even pain is a mask. It's not a case of removing a mask to expose the pain underneath. It's that the painful mask itself is an expression of vulnerability. And it's also a coping strategy. It's a means by which the father can keep going. As soon as Lionel has admitted Jacob's delusion, moreover, his friend observes how little it takes for a man to look vulnerable. So vulnerability is a kind of mask through which social relations with others are forged not through exposure or not just through exposure, but through misrecognition. And the men end up laughing together to the point where Lionel is also almost crying and it does say the tears are rolling down his cheeks. Now this is a scene of vulnerability and exposure, but it's also one of misrecognition. And exposure here, I would argue, is just another form of misrecognition, it's another mask. 
So I said earlier, the novel portrays masks and unmasking, but vulnerability is not what lies beneath a mask, but another mask in itself in this text. So to return to Berlant, misrecognition here is both a performance of and a dissimulation of vulnerability as shown through the social masks. Now, moving on, the notion of a mask is particularly resonant in a contemporary age of internet-based communication, where social media is increasingly not only supplementing, but also replacing face-to-face -face interactions. Now, we've talked quite a lot about social media over the last two days. Um, so uh, some of what I say will chime with what others have said, some of it different, maybe. So a lot has been written about social media and vulnerability. Um, obviously, there are key safeguarding risks in online communication for vulnerable subjects. Meeting people um, online, uh, if you meet them in real life, they may not be who they, they say they were. That's obviously a given. My point is not that really. My point is that following Berlant, nobody online may be who they say they are. Everyone is misrecognizing themselves online and being misrecognized. But actually, that's also the case offline as well. Now, despite that, we do tend to associate online self-representation with masking. So I've got a couple of quotes here I just want to go through. So one study suggests that social media is but the latest avatar of hedonistic consumerism with its capacity to insulate us from real people. Note the language here, insulating us from real people are not real on social media. So social media has def definitely made us more interconnected but fails to deliver true sociability. Again, we have this reference to true, real, etc., as if online is fake or unreal, and social media, and, and, and there is some sort of real, so the sort of real life on the one hand versus unreal social media on the other. At the same time, though, other studies argue different things. And one study argues that the increasingly ubiquitous image-based social media platforms that are connecting people in new ways can actually facilitate a kind of human connection that mitigates loneliness and cultivates happiness. Indeed, cyberspace could be a place that fosters authentic happiness just as much as the real world. Obviously, I could have chosen a whole load of quotations about vulnerability and, and internet and social media usage. I've chosen these because they highlight a sort of real authentic versus fake virtual dichotomy which is actually endemic in a lot of writing on social media. In fact, there is this assumption, which is really prevalent, that re relationships established or played out online are always in some way unreal, as opposed to real life interaction. Now, this assumption is somewhat countered in the last quotation, but there's still in that a persistent binary between cyberspace and the real world. And I think that there's an issue here with that, that, that kind of constant binary. So we need to bear this in mind as we move on to our next text, uh, Camille Lorenz, Who You Think I Am. And before I do move on, I just want to do a little bit more from Berlant about intimate public spheres and social media vulnerability and misrecognition. So the intimate public sphere. Intimate public spheres, according to Berlant, provide the feeling of immediacy and solidarity by establishing in the public sphere an effective register of belonging to inhabit when there are few adequate normative institutions to fall back on, rest in or return to. So social media may provide a space, both intimate and public, and I've given you an image of, of, um, of Mumsnet, which is a space where potentially vulnerable users post the most intimate of stories they might never tell people in real life, protected by the alienness alias, or the mask of an invented username in a public sphere. And, you know, that, that, that's not just Mumsnet, that's all sorts of internet forum. So some forms of social media could constitute a space of belonging that would appeal in the absence of other spaces of belonging, particularly for vulnerable subjects who are seeking to cite and stage an identity in relation to others. They might, you could argue, enable users to feel recognised, or at least to feel misrecognized in a bearable way. But of course, they don't know who's reading what they write, or if someone can work out who they are in real life, I suppose. They don't know if they're being seen in the way that they project. Balant writes, in relation to engagement in intimate public spheres, not specifically speaking about social media here, I should add, 
that participants can be passive and lurk, deciding when to appear and disappear, and consider the freedom to come and go, the exercise of sovereign freedom. But this freedom is, of course, illusory, given that it's bound up in the cruelly optimistic conviction, firstly, that you can be recognised under a falsified identity, secondly, that the intimate public sphere of social media can be a, a valid space of recognition, and obviously there's a third point, which is the extent to which users of social media actively control their own engagement with social media is questionable. Um, and I think we're probably all guilty of that. So, yeah, yeah. so just to sum this bit up, social media constitutes a privileged and contradictory site from which vulnerability is both articulated, people daring to say what they wouldn't dare say uh, face to face, and dissimulated. People are unaware of what they're actually exposing or of what the consequences are. And the faces of vulnerability are both concealed and exposed. And this is precisely what we see at work in Lawrence's novel. So who you think I am is very explicitly about masks, disguises and misrecognition as, as you just said yesterday. It evokes dangerous liaisons and the plays of Marivaux, which are, are both celebrated 18th century French representations of the risks of assuming other people are who they appear to be in the context of apparent intellectual enlightenment. So this novel explores the virtual spaces of social media through characters who invent pseudonyms and use other people's photographs to misrepresent themselves to meet other people online. I think this is called catfishing. If I use dodgy terms to refer to internet things, forgive me, I, I'm, I'm a little bit clueless about internet, but anyway. Um, so the middle-aged Claire Millicam calls herself Claire on tune, pretends to be a 24 year old in a badly paid fashion job and posts somebody else's photo that at one point she says she found on a Google search, later she says it's a photo of her niece in order to befriend her ex-boyfriend Joe's best friend Chris on Facebook so she can keep an eye on what Joe's doing. Now, the first three pages of this novel constitute one very long and very disorientating sentence, largely unpunctuated about aging women lacking social value, being violated, even being killed. It is an extended angry rant, which following Berlant, I'd like to call the female complaint. So Berlant's the female complaint argues that the female complaint typifies the banality of female suffering dismissed as being inferior, unworthy of attention and effectively shut down. In other words, a woman can speak out about her suffering, but only because the patriarchal social context in which she makes her utterance hystericizes it for her. So before she even begins to speak, her voice is framed and shaped by a context that positions her as weak, whining, pathetic. Balance suggests that public female protest discourse is always in danger of ending up like this, written as it is in a context in which it is always vulnerable to be so named a nag, a whine, a complaint. In other words, female protest is intrinsically vulnerable due to its contextualization and perhaps also its medicalization. Remember, a complaint is also a medical condition um, historically. And also the implication of the uncontrolled female body and voice. Now, Berlant argues that the female complaint is thus an aesthetic witnessing of injury. For me, this summarizes the framing of who you think I am. This is, text is really an articulation of injury that stages its own wounding in the enactment of a silencing and hystericization of a vulnerable female subject. Um, in a more positive note, the text also highlights its own mechanisms of silencing even as it repeatedly allows the female subject to voice her complaint. So you get the silencing. Um, I said that was positive, that doesn't sound positive. What I meant is that you see the silencing at work, we see the mechanisms at work and it allows you to observe them and notice them. So there are multiple versions of the story in this text. I'm not gonna go through them in detail because you'll just be completely lost if you haven't read it. And to be honest, even if you have read it, it's impossible to keep track. There are basically several different versions. One version she falls, even Chris falls for Claire online, presses to meet her. She breaks up with him. He commits suicide, um, as you was talking about yesterday. She ends up in, um, plunging into insanity, being hospitalised. Different version told by her doctor, where Joe admits that he invented the story about Chris's suicide. Third version, Claire as herself meets Chris, enters into an intense real-life relationship with him, um, and he moves into her house. 
she gets jealous of his old relationship with Claire on tune. She rekindles that by going back on the old burner phone, invites him to a bar. Before he goes to the bar, he finds the burner phone. He knows what's going on. But he still goes to the bar and meets her niece, Katya, whose photo that she used she used to set up the, the dodgy profile in the first place. Uh, fourth version, a writer called Camille, so Camille Lawrence, recounts pretending to be Claire on tune, but then meets Chris in her own a- name, starts a, a real-life relationship, which becomes abusive when he finds out her real age it doesn't really matter which version of the story you choose to take uh, here because there is no definitive original story um the psychiatric dr mark says at one point that these people write over the truth they make it disappear with their all their narratives so he's implying that there is a truth but in this novel there is actually no truth underneath and i would say it becomes impossible to distinguish the real from the masks so this is very much a text about misrecognition. Talking to the doctor, Claire Millicam in the psychiatric hospital, Claire Millicam states, here, I'm seen. Everyone sees me here, so I'm staying. She's implying that she's visible and recognizable in this protected space where she's not visible and recognizable as a middle-aged woman in the society outside. Her choices are always based on a desire to be seen, implicitly a desire to be recognized, which she ends up equating to Facebook likes, to the desire to look younger, prettier, and in her words, not to get lost. In other words, not to be recognized, not to be seen, to lack any identity. Now, this is highly gendered. She says that men have time, space, the streets, the city, work, thought, recognition, the future. And recognition is my emphasis, I should add. In other words, women are more vulnerable subjects for whom recognition is both more crucial and less possible. And she does admit to the analyst, I want it to be recognized. Uh, for someone to say, there she is, you know, like when a baby's born, when the father recognizes the child. Yet, yeah. ironically, she seeks to be recognized through faking an online persona with a false name, age, background, and cover photo. While she immediately mocks the analyst's interest in her reference to her father, so she says, okay, now the analyst's stirring with the reference to the father. The model she evokes here is telling, I think. So the father rec- usually recognizes the child as his own, or rather recognizes himself in his own child. There's a sense of, re- of possession here. So that recognition is also partly self-affirmation on the part of the father. In other words, the father recognizing the child is really recognizing himself and also his own authority. So the narrator continues, uh, when I say I want to be recognized, I mean with all the gratitude of recognition, recognition, it's her and I'm happy it is. There she is, here I am, and the link between us can't be denied, can't be erased, indisputable, inalienable. So recognition to clarify is not simply knowing who somebody is, but recognizing them as a subject, giving them worth, how precious your existence is, and stating a kinship with them. The link between us can't be denied. So this is Claire's underlying motivation. But of course, as I said, the irony is that she does so through faking an online persona. So if anyone did recognize her worth, it would obviously be a misrecognition. So this text foregrounds strongly the problems in basing identity on recognition or rather on misrecognition. So when Claire phones Chris Millicam, having already spoken to him in the guise of Claire on tune many times, She writes that, I was afraid he'd recognize my voice. So she deepens her voice. But then after it, she says, he didn't suspect a thing, of course, and how could he? He'd have actually needed to listen to my voice, to pay attention to me, to recognize me. He would never listen to her or recognize her because he wouldn't value her as a subject. And this is staging what Ballant calls the poetics of misrecognition. Because Chris not only fails to recognize Claire's voice, but he also fails to recognize himself. Note that she says, Um, There are people like that who really don't know who they are. He doesn't know himself at all. So this text stages a series of misrecognitions, and there's only one recognition in the whole novel, and that's at the end in a video shown by Claire's ex-husband, Paul, showing Claire and other people in her institution acting out a scene from Marivaux's play, False Confidences, which could be another title for, for this novel, in fact. And Martin says, this is my lady, I recognize her. Now, there's a massive irony here, claiming recognition in a play where all the characters lie and fake their identities all the way through. 
Not only that, but Paul is showing this video to prove that his wife's faking mental illness. So he says uh, she's pretending, but this is obviously acting. What we're seeing is, is, is acting from a script. It's interesting that it's while pretending that someone can state they recognize someone else. And it's while watching a pretense that Paul thinks he can recognize his wife's psychic state. This recognition, of course, is another misrecognition and it's very violent. So he ends up saying, looking, noticing a tall blonde woman and saying, oh, I don't really know. I think she's, oh, yes, I do. She's no one. She's a writer who he vaguely recalls is called Camille. Obviously, here enters the figure of Camille Lawrence herself, although she's already entered as an I in an earlier version of the story. So the novel ends with a recognition that is a misrecognition. She's no one in the voice of a misogynistic man who thinks his wife is a hysterical liar. He criticizes the female family law judge, thinking that a man would understand better. So there's clear violence underpinning this recognition, which points back to the beginning of the novel with the three pages of female complaint. It shows the silencing of yet another subject, a female subject, Camille Lorenz. But of course, Camille Lorenz effectively performs this silencing herself. And in this dizzying way, the female complaint in this novel, I would argue anyway, speaks in and out of its own silence, silencing and masking. So this novel shows the violence underpinning misrecognition. It shows what's at stake when subjects base a sense of identity on misrecognition. The individual fantasized quest for recognition is played out in a context in which the aging invisible female body covered with bruises, as we're told, is a site of violence. Misrecognition and fantasies of recognition violently mark the vulnerable female subject desperate to be recognized. Reading these misrecognitions and their impact on the female subject and body turns reading into an aesthetic witnessing of injury. And that's from the quote from Ballant that I gave earlier. And the witnessing of injury is also evident in the last novel I'm going to look at briefly, in which injury is literalized and inscribed by the body, this time uh, through children. So that children are kings or the children are kings. This novel was published in 2021. Uh, it features the story of two opposite women, uh, Clara, who rejects social media completely, and Melanie, who's absolutely obsessed with social media likes, in an era where you only live to be seen. So after trying to be a teen star of a, a reality TV show, Melanie, as an adult, sets up a family YouTube channel and Instagram page under the name Happy Recre to attract social media likes and popularity. So her aim is to sell a happy family through carefully curated images of her two children, Sammy and Kimmy. At one point, uh, once it's very successful, Kimmy is abducted and the novel follows the police investigation led by Clara to find Kimmy. This is a bit of a challenge because Melanie has given away far too much information about her whereabouts and her children's identity online, so they're easy to find and, and obviously very vulnerable. So Clara and her colleagues trawl through Melanie's social media posts for clues about where Kimmy might be. It turns out in the end she'd been taken by an old neighbour, Elise, who had noticed in the videos that Kimmy was looking increasingly depressed and detached and had decided to rescue her from that. Anyway, this is a novel about curated images of happiness, a warning about overinvesting in images on social media, and it does set up this apparent binary, which is offered in the blurb of the novel, between image embodied in Melanie and reality or truth embodied in Clara, and it does appear to uncover the truth behind social media mythology. You can see the damage of social media on the two child stars who end up reclusive paranoid and, and resorting to legal action against the mother. Melanie sees Happy Recre as the present she'd given her family. Now this is a present that once it's opened reveals the manipulation and control inside the packaging. So a few days before her daughter disappears, Melanie uploads a video called The Truth About Happy Recre where she talks about a bill concerning the protection of children's activity on YouTube. She's supposed to be giving the truth about her um, YouTube channel, but all she really says is, our children are very happy, we know that you're there and you love us, we too love you very much. This unveiling simply serves to repeat the same performance, underpinned by this illusion of intimacy with the subscribers who love their family just as the family loves them. So this illusory intimacy is deployed by Melanie to control her daughter. 
So when Kimmy wants to stop making YouTube videos, she actually says on a video, I wanted to say goodbye to the happy fans. And her mother says to the camera, without looking at her daughter, you're too young to say goodbye, my darling. Imagine all the happy fans who love you and would be so unhappy. So Melanie threatens her daughter with losing everyone's love, claiming that if Kimmy refuses to continue with the videos, nobody will love you anymore. And she does actually say that. So the language is really telling. Melanie's own love is absolutely conditional to the video performances, putting her in the position of the fans who would no longer love the daughter, they no longer saw her. And obviously this raises questions about, about the role of the mother here. Um, underneath the pretense of the happy family, the novel exposes the coercion and cruelty behind this YouTube channel. And I think it does it through the notion of unboxing. So unboxing involves children, or adults I guess, opening coveted gift packages containing gadgets, toys, games, consoles, etc. Now the key point here is that unboxing seems to be about revealing what lies inside the packaging. So unboxing would seem to be a metaphor for looking at what lies beneath the mask, beneath the packaging, to see what's inside. But actually the novel shows it's a lot more complicated. So firstly, the gifts the children unbox are received as if they've fallen from the sky, but actually they're obviously freebies sent by companies to generate publicity. So the act of unboxing the gift doesn't just reveal a surprise, but makes visible cynical marketing tactics. There's also another type of video where the children are blindfolded to taste and compare two different versions of food products, one with a well-known brand label called the, the true one and the other the imitation, which is referred to as the fake. The children have to guess which is real and which is fake. Um, and obviously the implication here is that um, one is superior to the other, that one is an original and the other the copy. But of course, um, the own brand could have come before the famous branded version. And if the children can't tell the difference, either they're lacking discernment, or you could argue the original and the copy are so similar that they can't be differentiated. Now, the novel also, I think, unboxes the apparent reality behind the video. So we see Melanie's manipulation, Kimmy's unhappiness, Sammy's overwhelming need to please his mother. But there's another unboxing at a crucial point in the text. So when Kimmy's been abducted, Melanie is sent a box from the abductor and she's instructed to film herself opening it and then post the video on YouTube. Inside the box, Melanie finds a child's nail and her scream of horror when she opens the box literally echoes her children's squeals of joy at the surprise when they open their parcels. So her unboxing experience, controlled by the abductor, involves a literal part of the child's body. So it literalizes the way she's exploited and exposed her children's bodies through her videos. Indeed, both Melanie and the child's kidnapper dictate the terms of the video performances and its streaming. They both exploit children's bodies. The assumption made by the police is that the nail they can identify as belonging to a six-year-old belongs to Kimmy. However, we later find out it belonged to the abductor's own son, which had blackened and fallen off after a finger injury some time earlier. So my point here is that the unboxing of her child's nail, the apparent removal of packaging to reveal what lies beneath, is itself another layer of deception. And a further level of illusion is narrated as viewers of the video spread the rumor that she's been sent part of the finger rather than the nail. So what we see here is that unboxing doesn't reveal some truth, but just another illusion or artifice, both in relation to the videos and I would argue in the novel itself. So this novel very clearly foregrounds vulnerable subjects under the age of consent being exposed online. Or as I said, Melanie's also a victim. Um, her daughter's abduction triggers visible memories for her of being a poor abandoned little girl. The novel mimics the YouTube unboxing videos to expose the exploitation of the children, but I would argue that in doing so, it marks its own inevitable complicity in misrecognition. What the novel suggests is the extent to which unmasking is as much an illusion offline as it is online. In exposing, then, it is necessarily also colluding and masking. Now, this is clear in the characters of Clara and Melanie. So at the end of the novel, Melanie's gone further into fantasy, as we'll see in a minute, just keeps repeating, all is well. She won't give in to the grief of losing her husband. 
Clara, though, the detective, seeks to limit her internet access altogether. She says she wants to live on the margin of these supposedly social networks, uh, saturated with fake love and authentic hatred, and note the language there as well, on the margin of this web of illusions stuffed with selfies. However, Clara is equally marked by screen culture. She changes her clothes as she goes from work into her house. She refers to it as a change of costume. You could argue that she's also unboxing herself. She's also performing, she's misrecognizing and she's being misrecognized. And the reader is positioned in Clara's position. We want to find out what happened to Kimmy. And obviously a crime novel is the ultimate unboxing, watching a detective unbox a criminal. But ultimately, we're shown via Clara that we too misrecognize when we unbox. So unboxing becomes a powerful figure for the ways in which vulnerable subjects are exposed and violated. But also, I would argue, for how this is a culturally condoned spectacle in which we're all complicit. This novel, I think, dramatizes Berlant's statement about witnessing injury. The reader becomes not only the aesthetic witness to injury, but the witness to the aestheticization of injury. And I think both the narrative and the reading process end up bound up in and complicit with the injury of misrecognition. And that's how I want to just conclude. So all three texts depict vulnerability through the need for recognition, a need that ultimately necessarily generates misrecognition. The threat of violence underpins all three of the novels here in different ways. Now, if we just look at the reaction to Melanie in the last novel to her husband leaving her, she says it's a, she's a fairy after all, she's not afraid. Fairies can't be touched. Fairies aren't afraid of anything. Fairies know who's good and who's evil. Fairies are above worldly contingencies and the vile attacks the world causes. So the extent of Melanie's self-delusion is really striking. She thinks she's a fairy. She thinks she's above the world, untouchable, all-knowing, able to recognize. Now, if we transpose this to reading, which is what I've been talking about in the last couple of slides, you could also argue that reading is equally bound up to some extent in a fantasy of recognition, a fantasy of being above in some way. And my readings today have highlighted the extent to which we need to rethink the reading encounter differently in terms of vulnerability and recognition. So I would argue the reader becomes complicit in the aestheticization of injury. The reader is turned into a witness, not a detached observer, but someone caught up in the assumption of, mis of recognition. <clears throat> we inevitably assume that we can unmask or see beneath the mask as we read. So reading about vulnerable subjects risks turning into a YouTube unboxing video as we collude in wounding misrecognition. Now, to go back with, to the original statement with which the paper began, recognition is the misrecognition we can bear. The problem is that for many subjects, there is no bearable recognition. Exposing vulnerability does not mean unmasking or unboxing it. Instead, I would argue we expose vulnerability through the recognition of our own misrecognition, or rather we don't recognize our own misrecognition because that would be another misrecognition. We have to actually acknowledge that reader, reading cannot simply equate to recognition. Reading is always necessarily a, a fantasy of recognition that is in part a misrecognition. So to end, I'm arguing that reading involves a renegotiation of the aesthetic witnessing of injury and of our relation to the faces of vulnerability, whether they're masked, unmasked, or otherwise displaced. Thank you very much for listening. I'm aware I've talked for a long time, so thank you. I shall stop screen sharing now. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this incredibly rich paper. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll leave it to the floor first. Shall I, I start then? I really liked um, your introduction, especially um, about students, because now that they've taken their, their masks off or I see them, they sent me videos of the orals and it's as if they were naked, as if I wasn't supposed to look. It seems very strange because I've had like a, you make a mental image um, in your head of the, the people whom you've never seen without the mask before and then it doesn't you don't you don't recognize them in real life it's quite it's quite interesting so thank you very much for that so um i want to start with the question of of misrecognition and i have a kind of a double question so how do you think that um, misrecognition impacts our, our capacity to form attachments 
and how it may affect our own um, acts of identity formation because we, we tend to change our, our modify our um, identity depending on whom we're interacting with. Yeah, sure. Interesting question. Um, I don't know how Balant would answer your question, but I'll answer it the way I see it. I think the way I see it is that we only form attachments through misrecognition. So that any, so it doesn't affect our capacity to form attachments. It shapes our, our capacity to form attachments, if that makes sense. And that the idea that we could form attachments without misrecognition, I think would be a fantasy that would ultimately be a misrecognition. I suppose what's interesting is trying to, how we, how we recognize our own misrecognition without another layer of misrecognition. That's a bit I can't quite get my head around. Um, and I can cheat by saying, how do we acknowledge our own misrecognition rather than how do we, how do we recognize it? But I appreciate that's a cheat. Um, what was the second point part of your question? Sorry, I, I only focused on the first bit. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering how uh, misrecognition affects our own acts of, of identity, uh, identity formation, and the way of how we interact with, with people that we misrecognize or we might be misrecognizing ourselves, if that makes any sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think uh, following the logic of the paper, I think that any identity formation, again, this is such a cop out, isn't it? I, I'm, I'm really cheating here, is, is itself a misrecognition. And where we think we've established an identity, that would be a fantasy of recognition that is actually a misrecognition as well. Um, to put that in a, in a kind of um, a banal context, it's like, I don't know if it happens to you, but you walk past a reflection of yourself and you think, oh my goodness, that's not me. Is it? <laughs> and, and obviously it is a bit like when we made all those videos and you had to listen to your own voice and realize that's what you sound like. Th there's definitely a, a gap. I think the point is though, that it's not that we know who we are more authentically than anyone else. I suppose the same misrecognition applies to how we see ourselves as it does to how we define our attachments to other people and, and how we see the world in general. Um, so that sounds really cynical. I don't mean it to sound cynical, though. I think it's it's not necessarily cynical. It's just a question of how you engage collectively and reciprocally in those fantasies, I think, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. sorry for hogging the conversation, but I have your attention. Um, it's really great that you're talking about how we, we misrecognize ourselves um, because um, you, you talked about Camille Laurence's book but you didn't didn't um have the, the time to quite approach aging and in, um in, in depth and it's really interesting because a lot of uh, aging narratives um there's always a scene of, of misrecognition when people see themselves in the mirror or people see themselves on screen and they they take a, a moment to realize that it's there um that is them so it's kind of a late stage mirror stage uh, <laughs> if you will so um i was wondering if you want to say more about how um camille Haas plays with that sure I mean, but my uh, the work i've done on aging which, which isn't very much i have to say it always seems that moment comes when you look in the mirror and see your mum or, or your dad i suppose or you see your parent looking back at you that that isn't that the classic moment in in so much literature where you see yourself and you realize that you've turned into your parent um in Camille, yeah, the, the book is really all about, about aging and about masking the signs of aging on the female body, um, which is obviously why she uses this fake photo to sort of attract attention, but then ends up in this awful position where she's going to have to show her own body in the end. Um, so I think a lot of the, the fantasy of misrecognition there is very much about being misrecognized as younger than you are. Um, now, it's interesting, quite a lot of of accounts of this novel see it as quite positive about female aging. I think you can read it in different ways. I don't see it as positive about female aging, um, but I accept that that the character is quite, I suppose, quite feisty and quite defiant, but I just don't read it as, as positive in that way. Um, the character is, is very angry, and I suppose you could argue that the three pages at the start where she sort of rants to the world is, is her more authentic self or a more authentic voice. And that that has, I think, been argued um, or at least hinted at in people's reviews of the novel, at least. But I don't see it as any more authentic. I just think it, 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 she's just, what, what the novel does is try out different performances of the body, of, of, 
of femininity as well, I guess. But I don't see any one as being more authentic than the other. So I don't see there as being this sort of singular aging self that is hidden and can be somehow unpeeled and revealed. It, it's just another type of fantasy, but I suppose it's a less bearable one because of the way society treats aging. I think it's positive in the sense that she engages with aging, um, but the, the way she does so, the ways in which she does so are, are problematic. And she said in an interview that, you know, what was I going to write about, about making jam? And I thought, well, we can just we can make jam and write about it. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely fine. Uh, that doesn't, um, you know, mean that you're not a valuable um, member of society. So there was there was quite a bit of ages in the play there. So I think Roberta had a question, if I'm not mistaken. I saw a hand go up at one point. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I wish I could have listened more today. I'm doing this horrible administrative job as well, which is <laughs> which I'm not doing very well. I think fail better is quite 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 relevant. Right, I'm going to turn my my camera on as well. Yeah, um, there was a couple of things I, I, I was going to say in response to your paper, which I thought was really, really, really interesting. Um, the first was about the idea of, of mediation, right? And I think from what you're saying, you take a, a, a more kind of Lacanian view that all, all relationships are about misrecognition, which I would probably agree with. Um, but I was thinking about um, the counter argument to that is that actually people might be Showing my camera. Sorry, I thought I'd turn my camera uh, on. <laughs> it's just a. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with it. Hang on, I just think it's easier if you're actually looking at people when they're talking to you. And there you are. Better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So um, the other side of that is that actually people might be more more honest online because it, when people talk about social media online, they tend to assume the you're talking about the bits that you post to the whole world. Yeah. But obviously all those, um, all those channels, all those platforms have private forms of interaction, don't mm -hmm. they? So um, I think the, the other side is true that people, and I was just thinking about mothers that, you know, the classic thing with mothers is not being able to talk to people they actually know because they don't want to admit kind of shameful stuff, but they might do that on mum's net because they're anonymous. Yeah. Um, even though that's public. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's very complicated. And, and you, you know, you really could make the opposite argument that people might show they're much more, true selves or they're kind of there's no true self but you know more problematic selves more more shameful or embarrassing selves precisely online because they don't have to bump into those people every day they might be living in other parts of the world and so on and yeah. it, it, it seems to be something that's really really missed from that argument like you say the distinction and and probably you know like you anyone who's read about Lacanian theory all this idea about kind of real relationships and fake relationships total nonsense isn't it because it's not it's just not the way that all relationships are mediated by fantasy whether they're online offline or or, or whatever um but the other thing I was going to say uh listening to you talk about the book about the the mother um, and these are French books that I haven't read, unfortunately, because <laughs> my French isn't good enough. Um, my, I've done a lot of work on this stuff about, um, you know, neoliberalism and motherhood. And my view of it really was that the kind of critiques of motherhood and the mother shaming in a fairly intense way was more of an Anglo-American phenomena. Um, and I wondered from what you were saying whether that's true. I think within a lot of the theory that I've been looking at, there's an idea that um, the sort of prioritization of the precious child, which goes with constantly criticizing and undermining mothers, and you know, mothers can never be good enough, all that kind of stuff, is seen as an Anglo-American phenomena that hasn't right, hasn't really kind of hit in in Europe yet. Um, and I wondered what you what you thought about that, because it sounded like that book was quite critical of the mother. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very critical of the mother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for two really interesting points. I'll just take the first one first, if that's all right. Because I totally, absolutely, people being more honest, more honest online because people don't know who you are. And the other thing I was thinking in relation to what you were saying is, 
an example of mum's night the other reason that you might be more honest anonymously online is to do with attachment as well isn't it i mean i speaking as a parent but but it, it doesn't just happen with parents with other people as well you you become wary of what you share about your children because it's their privacy as well you know yeah, so yeah, of course yeah it's not just that i don't want to say yeah. something about them to, to my friends it's also that you don't want their you know want to protect their privacy and there's a balance there as well isn't it is about preserving and keeping the attachment sort of um as, as as real as you can i mean my, my oldest daughter is 14 i remember when she she, she um she became aware of Facebook. She said, you must not put any photos of me on Facebook. I don't want oh, to see yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then she said, actually, you can, as long as I've chosen them. Have, them. have you seen them first? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the control yeah. is there. But I do think some of it, so some of it is selfish, I suppose, about, about how you communicate online, but some of it is about how you relate to other people as well, isn't it? It's protecting their privacy as well as, as, well as your yeah. own. Yeah. Um, so a really interesting point. I mean, take that. The mother shaming, that is fascinating. Um, I confess, and I probably should know more about this than I do, <laughs> that I haven't worked on motherhood very much in French. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be equipped to know. And other people in the audience might know better than me. Um, have you read Lullaby? Yes, I've written on Lullaby. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sorry, I should have read that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I yeah, uh, yeah I read, I'll, I've also written on mothers who've killed their children, in fact, which is also a, another... but. But that, that's quite different because I, I suppose what's most striking in French is where you get mothers who've killed their children. There's an awful lot of, of, of empathy, actually, in the accounts that are given. Um, yeah. It's actually a completely different approach. So it's, it's not a, an anti-mother thing. It is very much a almost uncomfortably positive portrayal of the infanticidal mother, actually, in French. Are you thinking of by the sea? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, by the sea, yeah. There are, there are quite a few actually that they're in a similar way where the mother is shown to be vulnerable and her responses are, are kind of, you know, you, you can see why she's reacting the way she is. And it ends up being very much a critique of society and the way society treats mothers. Well, very much so, very yeah. much so, yeah. I think in a way that's also true of this novel, to be honest, because yeah. the mother is awful, like she's just horrendous. Yeah. It, it does show that as a child she I wouldn't say she had a horrific childhood but it does show how she got to the to the stage she's at because she became obsessed with with well, loft story first it was the French um the precursor to be to big brother and more or less um and then she wanted to go on reality tv and was horribly abused when she went on you know, she tried to join a show and, and she was out of her depth and they they mocked her and she was badly treated so i think it does show how she gets to that stage mm -hmm. uh, as well as showing her as being fairly horrific um, yeah 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 it's, it, it sounded, yeah i don't know if that's the same though in, in an anglo-american um fictional tradition or not i, I think the anglo-american tradition tends to be more the kind of victim child yeah that that is really interesting because that what that's what I really found interesting in the in the kind of killing of the children narratives how little the space there was for thinking about the child in the French text so that it is in beside the sea yes you do you, you do feel the loss of the children but somehow overwhelmingly you sympathize with the mother um yeah and yeah but, you know the elder boy it's a bit heartbreaking <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it, he, he kind of guesses what's going to happen doesn't he and he, he can't he can't he actually wants to live but she's convinced that because her view of the world is so jaded and uh yeah and uh, it's very sad yeah very sad very sad but it doesn't make you feel sort of disapproval of or, or, or hatred or outrage towards her no. despite what she's done and how extreme it is whereas I was looking at people like you know Lionel Shriver's we need to talk about Kevin where you know maybe it's changed a bit now but the initial reaction was she's a terrible mother she's done all these awful things when she hasn't done anything at all I mean compared to the <laughs> the mother in 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 the French novel she's tried to be the perfect kind of neoliberal American mom who's who's completely focused on her children um so I, I, I don't know whether that moment has has passed of that really kind of extreme mother shaming that was maybe more a phenomenon of the, of the noughties yeah, I don't know. I think there is a privileging of the child, though, which might go with the shaming of the mother. Um, it, it tends to. It tends to. Yeah, yeah. To some extent. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that the, there are narratives of well, there, there are fewer narratives of, of, of men killing children, and obviously more men do kill children. But... Well, also men. I mean, I don't want to generalise, but men do occasionally kill children to get back at their partners. 
And apart from the Greek myth, and I can't remember the name, is it Clytemnestra where she does that? I would say when you look at uh, the amount of, you know, the actual crime statistics, that's very, very, very unusual for women, whereas it's, it's unusual for men, but not quite so unusual. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? It's framed differently. And it has, and I think it, it yeah, it has to be understood differently. I mean, the, the narratives tend to point you towards finding ways of supporting the mothers more. And, and it, 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 you can see very much how much they need that sort of social and, and political support as well. Um, yeah. Generally, I mean, like in, in the sea, they think they're protecting their children. Obviously, they're not. They're completely disturbed and they're murdering them, but they don't see it that way. They think that they're actually protecting them from a cruel world. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I don't know if you've read the novel written by Mitterrand's daughter. Um, it's called, um, oh, and I've written on it as well. Um, oh, and uh, Domnus and Mitya. Can't remember the name, and I have written on it, so that's really embarrassing. But but the the mother there is, is she sees herself as wrapping the babies up. So if she kills them, she puts them in the freezer, but she's preserving them. So she's freezing them to keep them sort of intact, almost. Um, yeah. So yeah, and that that was figured in the in the in the sort of real life accounts as well. Lots of women saying, you know, I wrapped the baby up, I I, I buried it in the garden in a sort of protective way. Um, well, I think there was a case in West London, wasn't there, a, year, a couple of years ago about a woman whose children all had a particular kind of genetic disability and she killed them all. Yeah, yes, I remember that. Um, but but generally the media stuff around it was quite sympathetic. Yeah, I, it, it was in France as well for most of those. It's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting how we, and I suppose it's, it relates to vulnerability in the sense that you're looking at competing in a way, vulnerable subject. Okay. I think that's that's the really interesting thing. I mean, I know we were talking about Cusk yesterday, but one of the things that she points out that in a lot of Anglo-American kind of culture, there's no competing vulnerabilities. The child is a vulnerable one. And it doesn't matter how vulnerable the woman might be seen, she's not going to be seen in that light because all the sympathy is going to go towards, towards you know, the precious child and the sacred child and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adina. It was the Cimitiel de Poupe, the Doll Cemetery. Yeah. Okay. If I can jump uh, back in on that, it's really interesting because uh, Rachel Cusk uh, did the reworking of the Medea. I, I yes. saw the Almeida and it's absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant up until the point I still, I, I, I haven't decided, still haven't decided all these years um, about that ending because the ch she doesn't kill the children, but the children um, try to kill themselves with uh, by taking uh, pills because they can't stand the, the tension between the, the mother and the father anymore. So she was heavily criticized uh, because she changed the ending and the she didn't kill the, the children, so you can't win. No, no you can't win, no. <laughs> well, they, they, you know, she talks about Greek myth quite a lot in Aftermath, and she was absolutely slaughtered for that. You know, it was like I was saying yesterday, you know, pretentious idiot. Why is she talking about her boring family life and using Greek myth? You know, who does she think she is? That, that, that kind of stuff. Um, high culture isn't seen to be appropriate applied to those humdrum things, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? The, it? Yeah, in French, though, you can get away with it. That's interesting as well. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> it does seem to be true. I, I'm generalising slightly, but I think it is true that there is a more, yeah, cert certainly in, in literary sphere it is anyway. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? It's now and ever. Oh, two participants raised their hand. Very good. Um, so, sorry. Um, oh, whoever raised their hand can can speak freely. It was it was, it was me. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you so much, Catherine. Time. That was so compelling, uh, really, really so rich. Thank you so much. I just wanted to pick up on one of the last points when you were talking about us as readers of novels in general and the three novels that um, that you presented and kind of you know the way that as readers we misrecognize the the experiences and that reading is a process of misrecognition and yesterday we talked about a lot about relatability and kind of re the relatability when when we read and you know reading things that are relatable and I just wondered kind of how do the two concepts match this idea of misrecognition when reading and relatability 
when reading for for us as readers yeah that's really fascinating and actually I was thinking about that yesterday when we were talking about, about relatability I think relatability is a is a bearable misrecognition <laughs> so I think that that we we're not actually really recognizing that we think we are and it's a comforting fantasy um, so I realize I'm coming across as incredibly negative and some sort of Lacanian mouthpiece. I'm not, this isn't necessarily my opinion either. I'm just, I'm just explaining the, the theory I was presenting, but, but I, I do suspect that that would be how, that, that's how that would fit in, in a way that we, we perceive that relation as a kind of fantasized connection that, because it, it resonates somewhere, it rings familiar, but it also maybe rings with an image of ourselves that we can accept Whereas we might not see as relatable something that is more uncomfortable and relates to some part of ourselves that we might not might not be fully aware of or might not fully want to articulate. I don't know. Relatable can be negative. You know, you can relate to, to people in, in a way that, but I just think there must always be a degree of, of sort of fantasy in there as well to make it possible. Otherwise, it would be too damaging, I think, maybe, if that makes sense. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else? If there are no more questions, I suggest we, we take a break and we convene at three for our um, a seventh panel of the conference. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just stay online uh, for a while, but um, you are free to come and go as you as you wish. So thank you so much again, Catherine. This was incredibly rich and fascinating. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I'll be back at three. I'm going to log off and reappear at three for the next session. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for the comments and questions. <laughs>